Welcome. So we're going to uh, begin with the January 14th, 2020 study session. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. The record will reflect that all members of council are present. Great. We'll start with clarifications of items on the consent calendar. Uh, Mr. Herdman? Ms. Dixon? Okay, let me get organized here. Um, there is one. Well, I'll just uh, ask staff on item number five, the clarification, just clarification on the ADU and the junior ADU. Uh, do we need to, or staff here, so Mr. Church, do we need to me, educate? Um, let me jump in and say I'm yeah. gonna pull that item Great. later. Okay. okay. Mr. Muldoon? None. Ms. Brenner? Um, I wanted clarification on the wine festival. Is that number 15? to find out what kind of outreach has been done on that as far as the community goes. If I understand correctly, I believe in our packet that's right up here, staff is recommending a, a continuance oh, at this time. Okay. Is that All correct? Right, good. Okay, good enough. All right, Mr. Duffield? I have none. Mr. Avery? I have none. And I have none. So let's move on to the next item, which is a uh, proclamation of Stanbridge University recognizing their recent student volunteer activities within Newport Beach as part of their Roots for Change native tree and bush planting initiative, I'll invite up right now uh, Jenny Roney, who's the Human Resources Director for Irvine Ranch Water District and the Volunteer Board of Directors member for Shade Tree Partnership, um, as well as Stanbridge University President Yasith uh, Wirasuria and Lisa Caraway, Stanbridge University Outreach Student and Alumni Affairs Officer. If you wouldn't mind coming up to the podium so we can recognize you. Uh, the reason that we are recognizing Stanbridge University is that last year, through their student volunteer efforts, they actually planted almost 400 trees and natural um, plants within the city of Newport Beach, and that is certainly something worth celebrating. Uh, so I'm gonna read the proclamation. I'll um, turn it over. Oh, you know what, I'm sorry. Um, I'm Miss Chair of Irvine Ranch Water District, Mary Eileen Mathias, thank you so much for being here. Um, so we have, uh, I'm gonna read the proclamation, and if you'd like to say a few words, and then we'll take a picture. So. Uh, whereas, after recent wildfires throughout California have devastated nearly 40,000 acres of land, Stanbridge University students took action and created Root for Change devoted to restoring the natural landscape. And whereas, the ongoing mission of Root for Change is to enrich and enhance our environment through the organization's goal of planting 10,000 native trees and plants across Southern California. And whereas, the city of Newport Beach is home to a diverse range of plant and wildlife, and is extremely supportive of its protection and care. And whereas service to others and being a good steward of our environment is a trademark of the American character and essential to how we meet our challenges. And whereas Root for Change has an ongoing partnership with Sa Shade Tree Nursery of Irvine, California, who provides these trees and plants at no cost in order to promote community growth. And whereas the initiative began on June 9th, 2019 with more than 70 volunteers from Stanbridge University, planting 100 native trees in the city of Newport Beach at East Bluff Park. And whereas on October 13th, more than 70 volunteers from Stanbridge University planted 273 native plants and trees at Harborview Nature Park. And whereas volunteerism creates a resilient community and provides career skills, education, and leadership abilities for all involved. Now, therefore, I, Will O'Neill, mayor of the city of Newport Beach, on behalf of the entire Newport Beach City Council, do hereby congratulate Stanbridge University, its volunteering students, and their Root for Change program for their continuous efforts and dedication to enriching our environment, bettering our community, and inspiring us all to work towards a healthier planet of which we all share. Congratulations. The mic is yours. Mr. Mayor and the City Council, thank you very much for the proclamation. We're honored to receive it. I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to Congratulate the city and its arborist, Mr. Kevin Picard, for actually leading the pack in this county and absolutely not having any barriers to getting approvals implanted. This, In fact, I'd like to quote his words when he said, It'll, I'll be remiss in my fiduciary responsibility if I didn't make this happen as fast as possible. We could have the trees. So whereas we've, we're working with a number of cities in the county who had to go through city council approvals, we'd like to commend the city and especially Mr. Picard for the fast, efficient manner in which this happened. We wouldn't be here today with uh, the great um, Irvine Ranch Water District and Shade Tree Nurseries, for which we were assured today we won't run out of plants. So we'll be back on the schedule in Newport Beach, planting again in Harborview, I believe, in a few months. Once again, we're very grateful for the proclamation, and thank you very much for, uh, for today. 
Thank you. I'm, I'm very pleased to represent Shade Tree Partnership today. It has been a long time a affiliate of IRWD, and we are very proud because we have been able to partner with such great partners as Stanbridge University and others to make sure that trees, living uh, item elements, are throughout not only throughout the County of Orange, but also to go further as we expand as much as we can. It's a it's a wonderful organization led by some very fine people, including Tom Bankowski and Leslie Bankowski, who are on our staff. And of course, uh, Jenny uh, represents the, a one of the very great workers who's there at every every event to make sure that things get done. So, if you could make a comment. Uh, well, thank you, Mayor Eileen. I'm just proud to be part of Irvine Ranch Water District and Shade Tree Partnerships. Um, it's a great organization, and it's also a lot of fun. You know, I don't get to get my hands dirty in the kind of work I do, so it's nice to be able to dig in the dirt and plant plants and see them propagated around the county. So thank you. <coughs> I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone from the city of Newport Beach, especially you, Mayor O'Neill, for this wonderful proclamation, and to the closed landscape manager, Mr. Pe Kevin Picard who assisted us and let this be our first project for the Route for Change initiative. We've expanded to three cities so far after that. So Mr. Picard initiated it, and after working with the city of Newport Beach for this Route for Change initiative, we moved on and worked with city of Irvine as well as city of Santa Ana. They followed the path. Again, he paved the way. And again, President Weir Saria, with his great initiative, decided to prompt for this. I really appreciate the opportunity you've given to our volunteers, and we have a new, another tree planting event coming up on March 8th at Castaways Park with the City of Newport Beach, and we're hoping to expand it even more and make this project an even bigger project with, with the City of Newport Beach and Sandwich University. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. We'll take a picture real quick. All right, moving on from protecting our natural beauty to item number three, <laughs> update on state housing mandate, regional housing needs allocation and proposed action plan. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to staff. Thank you, Mayor O'Neill and city council members. Happy New Year, we're excited to be with you today and kicking off 2020. With me, I have our deputy director, um, is, uh, Jim Campbell. We're gonna go ahead and dive into um, the study session item. This item relates to what's on your agenda for this evening, item number 20. So we're gonna share some um, thoughts and ideas about an action plan and our general plan process. And what we're looking for is really, it's just some, your thoughts and, and ideas and there's no, there's no um, decisions to be made until we get to um, this evening's item. So go ahead and jumping forward. One thing is really critical to understand with the, the arena discussion, and we're hearing a lot of it in the press and we're hearing it from other cities. Everybody's really unhappy. And just kind of stepping back a little bit just to understand what's transpired. Back in 2019, you know, from a staff standpoint, we spent a lot of time working with SCAG. And SCAG is the Southern California Association of Governments. They're the ones that are tasked to divvy up housing units to the Southern California region. We all were shocked when HCD said, for Southern California, you get 1.3 million housing units. And so what that did is that resulted in a RENA number of 2751. That number, if half of it is for low income and half of that number is for moderate and um, above moderate income individuals. We weren't happy with this number. We were actually shocked that the number came out to 2751 housing units. 
But we, we quickly accepted it and we, we had kind of, we we're trying to think internally of a game plan of how we're gonna accommodate the 2751. And again, I just wanna make a point that staff spent a lot of time on this with SCAG, with SCAG staff, with other adjacent cities, trying to come up with a, a rational methodology. You know, we vetted the entire process. And then things changed. So what's changed? In November, the county of Riverside submitted at the last minute a alternate methodology of moving these housing units from the Riverside area over to the coastal cities. And their argument was that the jobs are here by the coast, the jobs are in Orange County, the jobs are this way, don't put housing in Riverside. So, so this all happened in one fell swoop. The, the SCAG voted on this, we had absolutely no say, we had no opportunity to vet this, we, had, we, we only sent a last minute letter, Jaime Murillo, our, our principal planner, was there speaking against this, and they voted for it, and now it's set in stone. 44,832 housing units. So now from a staff standpoint, you know, we're clearly upset, everybody's upset, this is an unattainable number. We have to challenge the number, we have to come up with a plan on how to accommodate the number, and we're gonna get into that. And we have to do all of this by October 2021. So what's the remaining process? Trying to go forward now. SCAG is going to provide a comment letter um, based on this new revised methodology. Now, Mayor O'Neill, you sent a letter to HCD, and this is our, our letter of opposition, that this process was not vetted, and we're, we're now on record, and we've sent that letter to HCD. So we're waiting for HCD to comment on this revised SCAG process, and we're, we're hoping that this um, comment is gonna come very soon, possibly even today or tomorrow. SCAG may change their methodology based on HCD's comments, or they may not change their methodology, and we're stuck with that 4,832 units. SCAG we'll make a decision on their methodology sometime in February or March, and then after that, cities and counties have an opportune time to file an appeal. And those hearings, and then they go through hearings and they go through SCAG as far as who gets to make the decision on what this RENA numbers are going to be, and those hearings are in the summer of 2020. Ultimately, the final numbers are gonna be set by the end of this year, October 2020. So that's the SCAG process going forward. Now for us, from the city staff standpoint, we still gotta revise our housing element, and this is, this is something we do on an on eight year cycle. So what does that process look like for us? You know, we're gonna make recommendations this evening to just focus the general plan on housing, land use, and circulation, but we need a consultant to help us write these documents. What's changed a lot, because these units, the, the number is so high, we have to engage our community members, we have to engage property owners. You can't just say that property is now gonna get rezoned for housing. You have to have a dialogue with property owners and get buy-in. Um, so that's gonna take time. With any change on land use, you're gonna have to do an EIR, and that's understandable, you got CEQA compliance. We've gotta go through our planning commission to get their feedback and get their recommendation. Then ultimately, the, the housing element is gonna come to the city council for your final approval. Possibly with, the, with our charter, we may have to get a vote of the residents because of the, the enormity of these housing units. And again, all this needs to get done by October 2021. So what are the challenges going forward? So site selection is changed. It used to be easier in the past to say this property can be zoned for housing. Not anymore. They, the state has dramatically changed it, restricted it, made it very, very tough for us to get sites that can be in compliance. If you had a, a site in your housing element at the last cycle that never turned to housing, you can't use that property again. So our, our, our stock of properties has now dwindled and shrunk. And now it's gonna be even more difficult to find properties that are gonna be acceptable to convert to um, housing. And that's gonna be difficult, that's gonna be time consuming. Number two, length of time to complete the EIR. It's a long process. It's a long and expensive process. And just the, pro the time just to complete all the documents, um, all our documents, not even talking about the EIR, but just the documents in general is gonna take time. All this is cost, cost and resources. To do hire consultants, do the EIR, and, and if we have to go to a vote, that's gonna take time and money. So we formulated an action plan for the city council's thoughts and input. You know, we want, to, we want to challenge everything. We have to challenge everything. But at the same time, we need the plan B. The plan B is that we have to plan on complying with state law. 
complying and updating our housing element. So our objectives are a facility compliance with mandated deadlines and requirements. We just need to make our process easier, right? The process right now, this process is hard. It's gonna be difficult. We have to appeal the RENA number. The reason why is that everybody else is gonna appeal the RENA numbers. All the adjacent cities are gonna appeal it. Our general plan process is gonna be in flux. We're gonna have to focus a lot more attention on housing. And, and then regionally, we need to start talking to all our adjacent cities and collaborating as a, as a county. So let's, let's start with our, our action plan, facilitate compliance with state requirements. So as I talked about, it's gonna take a long time to get all this done and do it all by October 2021. We just need an extension of time. You know, we're gonna ask for two years extension from the state. We need time to get this done. You know, the EIR process we talked about, we've got to comply with CEQA. Sometimes the state has waived CEQA process. They've, they've waived it for the high-speed rail. They've waived it for the stadium up in LA. They have done it before. You know, if, if housing is a crisis for the state, then we need some flexibility, a little bit of waivers. You know, and we're gonna, we want to make that request. Um, we need to make some legislative changes, changes to our government code so it's easier for us to comply with the new housing laws. You know, we want a lot more credit for our ADUs. We want to be able to look at our existing housing stock and say, can we get credit for rehabbing some of these apartment buildings and converting them to affordable housing? And, you know, we've already started that process. Councilmember Brenner, you and I met with Assemblywoman Cotty Petronoris. We had a good discussion. Um, Councilwoman uh, Diane Dixon, you and I met with Senator John Morlock and we had a good discussion on that too. So these are conversations that we're gonna continue to have and we need to make some formal requests. We need to change our government code to make it easier for cities to comply. Reduced arena number for Newport Beach. You know, we need to uh, file an appeal, period. I, I can tell you, I've talked to some adjacent cities, everybody's gonna file an appeal. You know, Costa Mesa has, has 13,000 units, Huntington Beach has 11,000 units. You know, we need to file the appeal, not to say that we're gonna be successful in reducing this number, but we don't want this number to go up. We don't want it to creep up to 5,200 or creep up to 5,500. You know, SCAG still has an opportunity to change everything. If everybody's gonna appeal, we're gonna be vulnerable, so we have to file that appeal. Here I'm gonna, this is the part of the general plan process. I'm gonna um, hand this off to Deputy Director Jim Campbell. Uh, thank you, Simone, and Happy New Year, uh, Council. Um, as you know, we've been working with the General Plan Update Steering Committee over the last year on a general plan, a comprehensive general plan update and amendment. We've had 13 uh, meetings, and we've conducted seven workshops, one in each council district, you know, to try and educate the community. And we've been talking about RENA because it's obviously a hot topic. Um, we've also been listening and taking feedback from the residents throughout this entire process. And so it's actually been a lot of work. and. Uh, what we want to do, based on some feedback from the steering committee, is because of the magnitude of the arena, we wanted to check in with the council of what they asked us to do. Um, they're thinking of refocusing the update on the arena, and the staff shares that uh, recommendation as well. Um, kind of to pause the community outreach and maybe not talk about a, a, a lot of the other issues that the general plan update will touch, but let's just start focusing in on housing because we have a deadline that we have to meet. Um, some of the other comments that were received during the process, you know, the deadline, the state deadline, October 15th, uh, 2021, really shouldn't dictate the update process. And this, this, this process and how many housing units the state wants us to plan for is very transformational for the community. Uh, it'll be a big change. We really don't want to compromise our, our neighborhoods and we want to protect our quality of life. And so uh, the thought is, well, let's not rush this process to the extent that we can. Um, as indicated, you know, we're, we're looking to the action plan to do a variety of changes, maybe ask for state law changes, but also we have to plan for compliance, and that's probably part of what this is going into. Um, and so staff came up with several recommendations. You know, we, we, we see that deadline out there, there's a lot to do, so we wanna press forward. Uh, staff did recommend that we create a general plan up advisory committee um, and then move forward so we can actually get feedback from that advisory committee. So the steering committee is set up right now to just kind of oversee the listen and learn process, the outreach process at this stage. And I think the thought is, is that we kind of, if we refocus and we move forward a little more rapidly, we we're gonna need a policy committee that helps us, uh, uh, you know, obviously provide the a forum for public participation and, and, and outreach. Um, they'll obviously oversee that, but then they would also oversee um, and direct and provide direction on policy itself and how and where the sites are and what the policies would be to support 
the additional housing that we would need to accommodate and plan for. Um, uh, we're also recommending that we, you know, redirect city staffing and budget to focus on the uh, priorities, uh, principally the arena. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's the housing element, land use element, circulation element, and other applicable elements is related that, you know, just for internal consistency. But so we're in essence, we're reducing the scope of the comprehensive update down to really housing focused and housing centric. Excuse me. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit on the collaborate regionally approach that uh, Mr. Uh, Jurgis indicated. We, we do need to sit down and start talking to the other cities. I think strength is good in numbers. If we have a lot of cities that are nearby, we can kind of band together and we have a much more a stronger voice. So engage those cities, work with the California uh, League of Cities and work with the Association for California Cities of Orange County to try to, to strengthen our voices and, uh, you know, in furtherance of all the objectives that you, would in, that you find in the Housing Action Plan. Um, and that's part of the action plan that would be moving forward as well. Um, we also want to touch on the charter section 423. Um, you know, we do anticipate that this will require a vote or may require a vote of the residents because we're adding so many housing units. Uh, we anticipate that uh, we would exceed those thresholds and a vote would be required. And so we want to make sure everyone is aware of that. Uh, and at this point, I think we're going to move it over to Simone to finish up. Right. Thank you, Jim. There's been a lot of discussion about charter cities and rights of charter cities. And so going back a little bit, just to look to see what's happened in the past. You know, back in 2009, city of Irvine actually challenged their arena. And they made the argument that there were a charter city. And that, that argument failed, right? They got stuck with the arena numbers back in 2009. It was a high number. Um, and they, they made that argument as a charter city, and it didn't get very far. Same thing with the city of Encinitas. Um, they've actually, they're under a court order. They actually have a slow growth ordinance that everything requires a vote of the people as far as just kind of density increases. Their housing element is not certified and the state has come in, sued them, and a judge has ordered them. They must comply and they're not gonna go to a vote of the people. And so that's going through Encinitas. City of Huntington Beach is kind of going through the same process. Their, their housing element is decertified. Um, they're making arguments that they're a charter city and that is under appeal. You know, what we're seeing from a staff standpoint is that the courts are saying that housing is a, is a statewide concern and charter cities are not exempt. This is not carved in stone. This is still a fluid issue. It's a legal issue and it's complicated. But from our staff, from our perspective, we're not seeing that charter cities are making a lot of headway just yet um, with the charter city argument. Penalties, if we don't, you know, what we've heard that let's just, let's just slow roll this, let's take our time, and if we go th blow through the deadline, it, it's okay. From a staff standpoint, we're really concerned about that. You know, we're concerned that we're gonna be under the same gun and pressure as, as Huntington Beach or Encinitas has been, where there's court orders and judge orders. Um, the state has passed AB 101. You know, they've made it now tougher. The penalties are up to $600,000 a month if you don't comply. They may appoint a receiver and, f and rezone your city because the, the, our, our, we won't do it. So they've, they're playing hardball. The state is playing hardball with us. And so we're, we're very cautious of what the penalties are. A little bit of good news. I just want to talk about some good news. You know, this past cycle between in the last five years, between 2013 and 2018, just for the record, we have permitted over 1,700 housing units in the city of Newport Beach. That's a lot of housing. We've done a lot already. Um, now they want not only that, not only that want the 1,700, but they want up to 4,800 more, um, and 92 of them are for very low income units. So we've I, I want to say we've done a lot. We have a good good accomplishments here. You know, and that this is going to conclude our presentation, and just we just want some council thoughts on kind of a go forward basis on our action plan and and you know refocusing our, our general plan process. Um, the appeal and, you know, what are we going to do with, a, with the Charter 423. So happy happy to answer questions. Thank you. Okay. So if uh, my fellow council members will indulge me, I'm going to speak for just a little while um, because this is, I've been out talking to a lot of people about a number of these items. So um, Simone, if you wouldn't mind going back a slide. Um, so just to be clear, the answer to number four is no. Um, I think it's, I, I think that given given where we need to get to. Um, not only I think would that be unnecessary at this time, but it's it's an unnecessary fight because right now this is clearly not the 
that's not that's not the, the focus so unless my fellow council members disagree which i'd like to hear from the answer on that one is no okay so uh you're all here because you understand how serious this is uh I'd really appreciate it if you wouldn't mind sharing with your neighbors and friends how serious this is. Uh, this is something that is going to clearly dominate a lot of our city staff time, a lot of city council time, and a lot of community time for the next at least seven months. And so uh, we need all hands on deck on this one. Uh, there are, in, in talking with a lot of people in the community, my suggestion would be to think about it in three concurrent paths. Um, the first path is, pushing back on this from a, a legal standpoint, uh, from the appeal standpoint, and then trying to uh, get through, exhaust all, all issues that we can to try to determine uh, you know, where, the, where we have the ability to, to push back on a legal basis. Um, the other is a political basis. Uh, we do need to ask for multiple things. Uh, I think in that one, the two biggest things we need to ask for is more time and, and less units. Um, and so we need to determine the right path forward from that. It may end up being that we need to hire a lobbyist on this particular one, uh, whether we spread that out with other cities or we hire it amongst ourselves or within our city alone, but we need to get on that quickly. Uh, the third path is a compliance path. I know we called that an alternative B in the staff report in, in the staff discussion right now, uh, but I don't under, I, I don't see where we have an ability right now to, um, to ignore that path. And, so to the extent that um, we're moving down that path, uh, one of the items on tonight's calendar is a discussion about that, dis that committee. Um, so I think we've all had an understanding for the last couple of years that when we started this process, we'd like to try to follow the 2006 model where we had a steering committee up front to do a listen and learn phase and then a larger one to address a comprehensive general plan update. Um, this has changed everything, the way that the, the arena number has come down. And I, I think one of the things that was missing in the, in the discussion is just how many housing units we currently have in a city that's been around for 114 years, I believe, somewhere in that range. We currently have around 45,000 housing units in our city, um, asking for the next eight years to potentially grow out 4,800 more units is a big ask, um, and so that when we're when we're working down this path, the 2700 number I think was shocking to most of us. Uh, the 4800 number is it's serious, I suppose. I, I'm not sure what bigger word I can use, I, but because it is so, because it is going to require so much focus, um, I I do agree with staff's recommendation that what we do right now is we we get focused in on this this part of the general plan. Um, with the assurance that we would, once we get that stabilized, we would bring back and continue down the path of the comprehensive general plan update with the larger committee that we had anticipated in the first place. Um, but this requires such quick action and such, um, so much information and so much focus that uh, we simply cannot go down the path right now of a 25 person committee to address all of the other elements. Um, and so I, I do support that. I do want to make sure that we talk a little bit today at least about whether that makes sense, whether there's a different path. If it makes sense, um, maybe what, what some of the criteria we, we think would make sense for a committee. Um, so right now the staff recommendation is uh, a committee of nine people. Uh, there's no other than being a citizen and generally some land use understanding. Uh, there's nothing in particular that would cause us to look at a, a person um, positively or negatively. Uh, and in conversations I've had with folks in the community, I'm very much persuaded that we actually ought to come up with at least seven, maybe eight categories of expertise that we are looking for on that committee. And I'd like to, I, I'm going, we'll, we'll talk about that um, today. And I'd like to hear from the public on that as well, particularly because, and, and I, I say seven or eight, because we need at least one person to be the chair and that chair needs to be a fairly strong personality that has been through a process uh, where they can continue to move the ball forward on this. Um, because we need, to know by, we need to know by July or August where they are <laughs> and, what, and how feasible it is. Um, we need to know 
whether there is a uh, there is the possibility of actually complying with this number. Um, we need to know if there's not. Uh, we need to be in constant communication with HCD, asking a whole lot of questions. Some of them I'll go through in just a moment. Uh, but throughout this entire process, we need to we need to find out a lot of answers to questions that I think we do not have answers for. And I think there will be a lot of questions we haven't even thought of that will be coming up that we need to we need some pretty strong experts on. So we'll talk about the committee during this discussion to, because I'd like to hear from us, uh, from the folks up here. I'd like to hear from folks in the audience on this issue. Um, one of the other things that uh, uh, we had a discussion on during the listen and learn phase, the, it's not that we have to put 4,832 units, or zone for them, I should say, in the city. We actually have to break that down um, 1,452 units need to be uh, allocated to very low income, which is defined in Orange County as a four-person household making less than $60,000 a year. 920 units for low income, which is defined as four-person uh, household making $94,950 a year. 1,048 units, uh, household income of $117,500 a year, and then um, Above that is uh, 1,405 units. Clearly one of the uh, categories of people that we need are people who actually understand how to uh, build affordable housing, um, where the feasibility is for, for that kind of project because I suspect it will be difficult in Newport Beach to find 1,452 units for a family making less than $60,000. And so we need to find out how, how do you even, how do you, not only how do you zone for that, uh, but how, what, what will HCD accept in terms of the ability to, uh, to zone and find incentives and whether we have to provide incentives? And if so, how, how do we define those incentives? Um, so, for example, the governor in his budget that he just released yesterday uh, set aside a significant amount of money for affordable housing. We may need to be asking for a lot of that uh, in terms of grant funding. Um, Another question that we, we ought to ask, um, do floating units count? So one of the, issue, one of the questions that uh, has come up in the past is we have floating units in the airport area. Um, can, do, can we put floating units throughout our city so that we're not specifically zoning for a, a property, but actually um, out there? So I think that's something we'll need to be asking about. Uh, could you go back? a? The slide that you had that showed how many units we've adopted above our last arena allocation, that one. We ought to be asking, um, given that our last arena allocation was seven, five. Not 500, by the way. Five. <laughs> five. Um, we built that, we've had that many units built in our city. Can we get credit for any of that above our last reallocation? I think we still need to ask. Maybe the answer is no, but we still need to ask, um, and we need to push for that. I mean, that that is a lot of new housing units above our last arena allocation, and none of them, or maybe some of them, will count. But we need to find out. Um, we've we've discussed a little bit about the uh, the issue with charter cities. Uh, it seems that court opinions weekly are coming down these days. They're not exactly helping the home rule uh, constitutional provision in the in the California Constitution. Um, we need to continue to discuss how units are counted. One of the items tonight that uh, is on f is the update of our ADU and JDU um, ordinances. We've got to figure out how the whether where those count, how those count, and and what we can do with those as much as we possibly can. I suspect that given the statutes in place right now and and the new legislation. A lot of cities are going to be asking that question, but we need to be one of them. Um, our RFP that have got, that's gone out for a consultant, um, could you talk about that just a little bit? Uh, certainly. Um, in, I think it was about December 20th, we put out an RFP for consulting services, uh, principally centered in scope services, was centered around the housing element update, as we've discussed. Land use element update, in, in, in largely in, in our mind, that was to support the housing that we would be looking at uh, increasing the, the intensity of. Um, circulation element, that's a complete redo. We want to make sure that our circulation system, our traffic system, kind of comports with this added, uh, these added units. And uh, the RFP will be coming in, um, I believe it's the end of next week, Tuesday, next week. So 
Um, we should have those proposals in. We hope to have a, a fair number of them, um, and we'll obviously be reporting back to, to the steering committee um, and to the city council and, and others. I appreciate that. That one might need to uh, bypass. I would. That may need to bypass the steering committee if if we need. If from a timing perspective, it'd be great to get it to the steering committee first. But if it needs to bypass and come to us, just because this needs to keep moving forward, let us know. Understood. Yeah, I, I, for me, I'll just say for me personally, if we don't have enough or of the quality that we need to, we need to extend it out. This is this one's this is really serious, so, and so we need to be focused in on that. Um, when we're talking about the committee makeup, uh, one of the things we'll I want to make sure is that the process stays pretty firmly committee led. Um, we're going to be bringing in, I think, some pretty serious people through this process um, in terms of our community leadership. And so I want to make sure that that, that continues. Um, the, and then this is my last point, and then I'll, I'll open it up to my fellow council members. Um, one of the, uh, when, I'm, when I've talked with council members in other cities, and I've talked to actually quite a few, um, I've, I've asked them how they're going to handle this and they, they talk about it in you know, a whole bunch of different ways, but I think I'll, I'll just say, I haven't heard one person say uh, that they, they feel comfortable that they're going to be able to accomplish this. But I was talking to, a, I, I was, I was talking to a, another council member in another city who uh, had a higher arena number than we did. And um, that council member said, told me that they wish they had our number and I said, well, I wish we had our, your Coastal Commission issue. And they, they said, well, what Coastal Commission issue? I said, exactly. Um, so let me, just, let, me just ask, let me just ask this, though. Um, I mean, as we're looking at, so the Voice of OC ran an article. Some of you probably read it. Um, and my quote in response to the question of whether this was a fair methodology was that you know, we're a city that's, that's now had more allocation pushed into our city, and we're covered by... Uh, government agencies like the Coastal Commission and FEMA um, and many other state agencies and regulations. I know, for example, folks in Newport Coast are starting to have their fire insurance not renewed because state maps have uh, been changed to show higher fire zones in the area. Um, and so have we taken, have we, have we worked yet, because this might be part of our appeal, have we worked on looking at basically every neighborhood in our city to determine what other agency regulations there are, laws or regulations coming from state or federal um, agencies that would prohibit uh, the kind of growth that, that's being discussed by, the, by HCD and SCAG. And, I, and I'll, let me come back to that for just a second to clarify what I mean by that. The purpose that I keep hearing when I read articles about this and quotes from legislators that, are, that have been pushing this in Sacramento is that the reason that we've got a housing crisis is because cities are um, artificially keeping it low through their own ordinances um, and charters and things like that. But in Newport Beach, I mean, about a third of our city is covered by the Coastal Commission jurisdiction. Um, all of Balboa seems to be covered by FEMA, Balboa Island. I mean, we were going through the flood maps on that. Newport Coast is covered by fire, um, fire maps. Uh, the airport area is covered by the FAA. I mean, uh, um, and, and so as we're moving forward with this, I guess the, the question <laughs> kind of boils down to this. Is there a square inch in Newport Beach that is not covered by a federal or state regulation that would either prohibit, diminish, or greatly reduce the capacity for that particular square inch to be developed? And thank you, Mayor O'Neill. I think you bring up an excellent point. And we haven't even started, begun even cataloging these issues completely. You know, and with your, your point taken with the coastal zone, the FEMA flood maps are fire severity zones. We have liquefaction issues. We have landslide issues that are actually mapped by the state. So none of these, we haven't, we haven't counted all this together and said what property, what piece of dirt is not affected by something. Um, so you, you bring up a good point, and we haven't done that yet. Okay. I think in the next 30 days we need to do that um, because we're going, to, we're going to need to appeal. Uh, we need to have good, good justifications. We need to have good justifications that are unique to us. Um, and it seems to me that those are some of the best ones that I could, I could at least come up with. Excellent. But I'm sure there are smarter minds than mine to come up with that as well. All right. Mr. Herdman. All right. Uh, I have several things I want to say, and I want to give credit to someone, too, for what I'm going to say. 
uh, given that there's no judicial remedy at this time, and that the uh, statewide housing needs would probably supersede a charter city argument when it comes to home rule. Uh, I met with a gentleman who's sitting out there in the audience before Christmas to talk about this Christmas uh, vacation, David Tanner, so I want to give him credit for this idea. Uh, I wrote my remarks out. It's an idea to, it's another layer to add on top of this that I would like us to give serious to consideration, uh, give, give serious consideration to. Given the fact that state housing stimulus bills that have gone into effect have created a significant imbalance between our general plan, housing, land use, circulation, and another one, safety elements that hasn't been mentioned. These imbalances place the people of Newport Beach in a potential very dangerous position in the event of a natural disaster or other emergency identified in the general plan. So I'm bringing a whole new element into this, which is <coughs> natural disasters. The issue here is evacuation of certain sections of our city on short notice. Also at issue here are recent wild land and urban wind-driven fire threats combined with public safety power shutoffs of electricity and our ability to protect our citizens. So, until we get state assistance and guidance to remedy these general plan imbalances created by these new housing laws, and until we develop procedures to implement these new laws and to fund required capital improvement projects necessary to ensure public safety, as a charter city, let's declare a state of emergency. And under California government code, 3100 and City Municipal Code 2.20 notify the state that we are temporarily placing on hold implementation of state mandates for population growth until such a time as the threat to public safety is no longer considered an emergency. This legislation has put us so out of sync with our general plan and has hijacked our general plan update process. I'm suggesting here that we simply exempt ourselves from all state mandates having to do with the new housing laws by declaring a state of emergency, which will buy us time to deal with the issue and will put the legislature on notice in terms of the need to fund their mandates on, that they place on cities. If our plan will be to replace the general plan update process with a housing element effort, then in order for this proposed group to do its work, I would recommend that we contract for an evaluation of the new housing bills. 47 in total have been passed and their effect on our general plan and on our city and figure out a way to keep control of our overall general plan update process and land use within our city because it sure does look to me like the state is taking away our local land use control. So that's my suggestion, all right? And something for us to also discuss here this evening. Thank you, Mr. Herdman. Ms. Dixon. Yes, you're up. Thank you. Um, couple of things just to factor into the policy uh, basis that was uh, taken by SCAG, I guess, um, is questioning a couple of things. First of all, the population. We've all been reading in the papers that the state is losing population. Migration is going out, not in, and to such a degree. I mean, it's the, popul the increase in population is the lowest it's been in like 80 or 90 years. Um, and the state is on the th threshold of losing a congressional seat. I, my overall question about the policy foundation of the f population projections is how do we challenge that? Uh, it's a rhetorical question, but I um, think it, it, it should be challenged. Also, um, I, in the last five years, uh, how many projects for additional for housing have been rejected by the California Coastal Commission? Um, and, or, and or FEMA or any of these other state or federal regulatory where proposals have come in and for whatever reason they have not been approved by authorities 
uh, greater than ours. So um, I guess what I'm thinking, and we talk about the legal, potential legal remedy or carving out exceptions to that, uh, I guess my question could be directed to the city attorney. In your world, your universe, Mr. City Attorney, what are you hearing from other cities? I mean, we could see the charter city argument is seemingly a dead end. What about other remedies given to the policy basis, given to the uh, cross-jurisdictional -jur authorities that weigh on, on agencies? And then I'll let you answer that question. I have another question. No, I think there's there's definitely, um, it seems like the cases are in a state of flux. There's been some new opinions that have come out of, at least at the trial court level, um, related to the charter cities and the home rule doctrine. So that's the one area that we're, we're monitoring. I do think there are benefits in uh, teaming up with other jurisdictions, you know, especially coastal cities, um, because we just don't have the land available to develop these number of units. And so I think that... Uh, Mayor O'Neill came with some great suggestions on how to go about that. Uh, also, what is absent in all this discussion at other, in, by other agencies is educational. Uh, what about schools to support 4,800 new homes plus how many children, uh, transit issues, transportation issues, infrastructure, water. Uh, there's a directive that's going to be coming in the in the next couple of years, I thought it was this year, but I guess it's in a couple of years, that everybody in the state of California is going to be limited to 55 gallons per day. Uh, I mean, all these new rules are affecting us, but at the same time, we're having, all cities, not just Newport Beach, are having to comply with these new laws and restrictions. Uh, one question, uh, Mr. George, is back to the listen and learn. Well, first of all, I do want to back up, and, and we're talking about the demise or the reconfiguration of the steering committee. I just want to publicly thank those members of the steering committee as the number of meetings, uh, community meetings, uh, and they all were uh, attended by each of the committee members and I, we all really appreciate their efforts to help us get this far. What did we learn in the listen and learn? I know it kind of during midway, we did a mid-course correction and started to introduce the concept of the arena uh, debacle, I will call it. Um, and there was an exercise where people put little post-it notes or Legos or whatever it was on the map. Did we, is there any takeaway from that that, we don't have to discuss it now, but I mean, it, that is that will feed into our beginning to get the community engaged in this and the sense of the community's engagement? Yes, thank you, Council Member Dixon. Um, there, there was um, some good feedback from the community when, with these workshops, and our consultant put together a heat map that shows those locations of where they would be willing, to, where the community would be willing to accept additional housing units. So, as far as kind of the deliverable, that heat map is going to be very, very um, important for us going forward. That's a good basis. And then my final comment is: currently, we're reading in the papers that Senator Weiner from San Francisco has SB 50, which is another transformative piece of housing legislation, mandatory housing legislation. How are we going forward and monitoring it? I know we have uh, retained services of some lobbyists and legislative council. I really want to suggest that we are on the front end of these things now because in, with SB 330, which is, and seven, 16 other pieces of legislation that went through the process last year, and we're passed and nobody, we wrote a letter to the governor in September to oppose all of, most all of these bills, but there was really little community action on that. I guess what I'm saying, I, we need to mobilize the community and the current bills that are being produced and Wiener's proposals that will be devastating to this community. Uh, we need to be on the front end of that and, and have our voices be heard. I know we have a legislative policy platform, but we need to really be active on this and have spoken representation at these committee hearings in Sacramento so we are heard. And all the cities, I, we're not alone, but I think the cities need to be, have a voice in these hearings that are ongoing in Sacramento, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Avery. Um, Mr. Churches. Um, no, how important that last point. This isn't spread out across the state, is it? I mean, Northern California, what, what what are their arena numbers up there for those cities? You know, Marin, Marin County, um, that comes to mind. Their, their housing numbers are very low. I don't have that in, in front of me. And I know their due date is like 2023. Right. You know, so they're, they're pushed out. So right now it's, it's kind of spread out. Southern California is really hit hard. 
um, with Why this is that? Um, each city is on a different cycle. Um, there, there's a majority of cities that are under on an eight-year cycle. Um, other cities, uh, potentially because of, of past penalties, on a four-year cycle. So over time, things have changed. So not not the regions, not all in in one cycle. Plus, HCD can't handle, you know, all the workload that'll come in from all these cities. Right. So Santa Ana, for instance, do you have any idea what their number might be? It, we want to say it's we we believe it's around in the three thousand. Six six thousand. Six thousand. Correct. Mm -hmm. Very low compared to Newport. But there has been kind of a push toward coastal cities. Correct. And the argument from County of Riverside is the jobs are by the coast. The infrastructure is already there. We already have the freeways. So move those housing units by where the jobs and the, the, the roads are. And the County of Riverside says, you know, we, we can't handle more housing in this area. We're not prepared. And there's no jobs here. Right. Um, yeah, I, I just think this is, on the face of it, um, you know, it, it appears to be good public policy. We have to do something to, the state has to do something to provide housing and affordable housing for people. And I think everybody knows the reasons why. It's clearly evident when we go around town and uh, what we read and, and hear if we're paying attention. It just seems to me that um, the burden that's thrown on coastal cities is, and, and Southern California and our area in particular is, really excessive and uh, so I won't repeat the reasons why uh, but I think we do need to engage our our, our citizens to uh, make it known the uh, amount of uh, stress this is going to cause our city I just think of like in my district the west side um, that's an area that is already underway with quite a bit of housing th through Costa Mesa and uh, your, those roads are already, if anybody that's done 17th Street and trying to get to Trader Joe's, it's just absolutely gridlock. And uh, this will just compound all that. And it's, it's a huge, huge thing to kind of cram down on um, a city like ours on such a tight deadline to respond. And so uh, it's, it's, um, it almost is punitive in my view uh, for us. But um, I think hopefully if the citizens um, can uh, participate in this in our effort to uh, get more time uh, to uh, reduce the, the near-term impact so we can absorb it and our residents can absorb it at a pace that sort of makes sense, um, that would be a very good thing. So, and I know staff's working, will be working diligently toward that and I agree completely with the mayor's comments uh, on each sort of um, steps and uh, the situation is really evident that um, it's, in my view, more than we can reasonably handle, given everything else that's going on in this city. And I know how burdened staff is even right now with the amount of building that's going on right now. It's, it's incredible. But to jump this, put this on top of it is uh, really something. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brenner. Um, I just agree with what everyone has said. And obviously, we. Um, we sort of have this attitude of the sky is falling because it really slammed us and surprised us. And so now we're just trying to wrap our, our arms around it and figure out how to move forward. And I think the multi-pronged approach that you're talking about is, is our, only, uh, our only hope. But one of the things I keep saying to people is we really need to emphasize traffic because it's not like we are going to mind that there's maybe a little longer line at the supermarket. It's the fact that we're going to be stuck in gridlock that is the major thing. And I think to emphasize to the governor that um, we're willing to do our fair share, but we need help in the area of transportation. And so that's one of the areas that I really feel like we need to be looking at in a real uh, progressive kind of um, orientation, like what can we do to really move people around our city and around our area in a, in a regional effort because we can't handle much more traffic. We can't get to where we need to get. And so that's one of the major issues. But I just want to point out that one positive that I have seen out of this is that um, Mayor O'Neill asked me to set up a meeting for us with um, representatives from Spawn and Line in the Sand. And 
I thought that was, it, it's not something that we traditionally have been doing. It's something that those groups have seemed like they are antagonistic and um, not antagonistic, but that the, the goals have been so disparate from that group and the development community or even the council and even our um, community development department. So I think the fact, and we had a wonderful meeting. Jean got representatives from both those groups to come and meet with us, and it's like we are all on the same page now. We are, it's like the old saying about my enemy's enemy is my friend, and it's, um, it's like now we sort of have a common foe that we are looking at, and we know that in order to protect our community, we all have to come together and work on this to find ways that, um, that we can deal with what we have to deal with, do it in a way that hopefully is not going to kill our community, and I think that's a real positive. And so I was very encouraged by the people in that meeting, by Mayor O'Neill's orientation of recognizing how important they are and how important um, the mission is to maintain the integrity and the beauty and the harmony of our city. And so I really think that you know we're gonna be moving forward in a way that we've not moved forward in the past where we really are working together to protect our community. So if there's one positive to come out of this, it seems like maybe that's it. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a good analogy, but I just wanted to let everyone know. I don't think I have enemies in the city. So anyway, um, <laughs> just, just I understand. I understand. <laughs> just, just saying. All right, um, Mr. Duffield. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> this is obviously <clears throat> not something that I have the solution for, but I would. One thing I did hear that I would like to comment on was this um, jobs thing. So in 1998. I moved my factory away from here because the Southern California Air Quality Management District wouldn't, didn't like manufacturers, and so we have been displaced. So my argument is <clears throat> the jobs that you're talking about are service jobs. They're not manufacturing. Manufacturing is where you get the lion's share of work, workers, and Riverside has a lot of manufacturing. I wanted, to move, I wanted to move my factory to Riverside. It's a lot closer than where I am now. But again, the Air Quality Management District didn't have enough VOC allotments for me, for me to move there. So I would like to maybe offer that argument, if we ever get, we get to that point, that um, I, I'm an example of the exact opposite of what we're hearing, that people are moving to the beach for a job. My, com my commute is 95 miles, and I, want, I would argue anybody wants to get on the Newport Freeway at, when I do, and you think that the people are all driving to the beach to work? I'm driving on three fr major freeways that are packed, and everyone's working inland, not here. They live here, but that's my one little point is that, um, gee, boy, I must be, I must be thinking wrong because it, it doesn't seem like <clears throat> the jobs are are here. Matter of fact, um, what happened to my my industry? Costa Mesa was the largest builder of boats in the United States in the 60s and 70s, and it didn't take but a, a few years, and whoosh, everybody left because the value of the land far exceeded what a factory could have support. And the, um, the jobs, you know, people were, <clears throat> the, the fact is that it, it just was too expensive to have a factory so close to the beach. This, this is a fact, and, and they all, we've all gone. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the spawn leadership when I make this statement. One of the decisive votes to pass legislation that gave us this horrific result was supported by our local assemblywoman. And I know that you wake up and you go every weekend to specific events and you 
sometimes are seen with this person, I hope you greatly consider who you send to Sacramento. I not vote for this governor. I not vote for the assemblywoman. And I'm dealing with the consequences, as always will for generations, with this imbalance to our community. And then some faceless, unelected locally board decides to give us all the, uh, the consequences here in Newport Beach. And it's incredibly frustrating because it's not a boogeyman. It's someone who we voted for, or people here voted for, who is making us face these consequences. So I know how much you care about our community. I'm asking you to join the leadership and return balance to the state. Thank you. All right, so um, we've all spoken. Let me, um, let me bring something back. So in terms of concrete steps that uh, we need to be taking today and over the next 30 days, um, one is we need to, if we're, if we're kind of talking about those three paths that, that we, had, we had discussed in terms of a framework, um, the first one, if we're going to be talking about the uh, a legal path, one of, the, one of the things is we need to continue to at least, we, our city attorney's office, I, we just need to, we need to do as much analysis as we can. We got to find something, if there is something, and if there's not, we need to know. Um, we need to be preparing for a, the, the appeal. Um, I very much would like us to, you know, hit the high points that everyone else is going to hit, but we need to be Newport specific on this one. So we've got to, we've really got to look at that every inch of land, actually, because something um, Councilmember um, Dixon mentioned was, you know, what do we learn during the listen and learn phase? And I see a lot of faces that were at that listen and learn phase. One of the favorite places for people to put it was at Coyote Canyon landfill because it's a wide open space and it looks like we could build there. But the, it's kind of one of those things. If, if we could build there, don't you think we would have built there already? Um, it's on top of a landfill. There are so many federal and state regulations and so many agencies that cover explaining why you do not build on top of a landfill. There's a reason why the county right now put an RFP out for a golf course. It's one of the only things you can put there. You can do a cemetery, too, to a certain degree. But that's not exactly the housing unit the state's looking for. So what I'm saying, though, is we've got all these regulations that are, that are coming down on it. And so we need to be really specific about about that um the the uh, political path forward we've got to continue to stay engaged um uh you know we pay we're members of league of cities <laughs> they've got to do something for us on this one i mean this is they've got to do something for us i mean it, it's just we've got to have that kind of uh, relationship and then we've got to find any other way we can make sure that we're having good relationships going forward with HCD and, and SCAG and whatnot, because we do need a situation where when we ask questions, um, we get, you know, we get good answers. So we probably do need to explore lobbyists and figure out who's, who's solid on this, on this item. And then in terms of the, um, in terms of the, the item that we have for tonight, uh, we didn't, we didn't talk too much about that up here quite yet. Um, but in terms of the committee, I mean, we, it is it is appropriate for us to talk about that right now. I can tell you. So, in the um, Councilmember Brenner mentioned one of my meetings. Uh, I've I've talked to a whole bunch of folks, and and it does it did come out of those meetings. I, I do think we need to have folks that are special. Look, we're looking for specialist um, expertise, I suppose, in a variety of areas. Let me just read you the eight that I think we ought to do, and then I'd like to I'd like to work through. Um, one, we need someone who is a, is either an affordable housing developer or has done affordable housing um, development work of some kind. We need someone who understands how to actually comply with what we're talking about in those thousands of affordable units. Uh, we need someone who um, understands environmental concerns and laws. Uh, again, we are covered by a substantial number of environmental regulations and we need to be able to um, work through this housing compliance, but also make sure we're working through on the environmental side as well. Um, we need someone who's good on transportation. I mean, the circulation element. Uh, I am going to ask you to discuss just a little bit about the sequent change uh, that went to vehicle miles traveled and what that effect will be on us as we're going through this process. But we need someone who understands circulation transportation. Um, we need, we need um, someone who's got an architectural planning background. Uh, we need someone who will understand what staff's going through and can, can make good uh, suggestions based on experience. Uh, we need someone um, who is good at stakeholder outreach and communication. Uh, we're going to, I'm sure that will be part of the discussion uh, for our consultant, but we need someone who can help drive the consultant on this one um, and 
and make sure that we're constantly out in the community, constantly talking with people, constantly making sure that this is as transparent as we can possibly be because one and the, you know, those first two paths and the third path, the third path being compliance. At the end of the day, we need people to buy in and understand that we don't want this either, but we need to figure it out. Um, um, they, these are, these are different. So I'm not wed to, I, we can combine them or we, but an economist, um, and someone certainly, let me back up. Someone certainly who understands financing, um, particularly in developments and how financing will play into the feasibility of developing the kinds of affordable housing units we're talking about. Um, economists probably make sense. Um, and then we need someone who has a good, strong legal background. Um, someone who can get in and understand the laws. Uh, obviously, we'll have the city attorney working with work, working with that. But someone who, preferably a lawyer, doesn't have to be a lawyer, but someone who has an under a, a good legal background. Um, and and then we need we need a chair. That's the ninth. We need a chair. Um, and so that that that's just a. Well, I think we all understand what that that position would require. But we need a chair. Um, there are, I'm sure there are other varieties of expertise. If, if I missed any that you think we should bring them in, let us know. If I'm missing anything up here, let me know. But um, this does seem like the path forward right now, at least on the compliance side. We've got to do everything we can to at least try. We've got to. Um, I, it, we just don't have, I don't, I don't think we have an option, especially when I'm seeing the, <laughs> I mean, I go back a few slides to where what happens to us if we don't comply. I mean, that's, that's unbelievable. I, I mean, I, it, there is a certain aspect to this where it almost seems like a, uh, you know, a giant protest when you have a thousand people, there are a few people that get arrested. Um, but the, the vast majority of them aren't going to be. I mean, I can't imagine the city's going to sue every city in SCAG that doesn't comply here, but I don't want to be one of those few people that gets arrested either. So that's part of the process. I, I mean, I'm seeing out there cities, um, are passing resolutions, which I think I understand. I think, I mean, maybe we should consider it, but, but resolutions, they're not, they're not pushing the ball forward on, from the, from the legal side. Um, and, and I think Newport beach ought to be, we, we need to be really focused. We really need to be pushing forward as, as much substance as we can on this. And, um, and that's what the next 30, 45 days need to be, especially because if we, if we approve the, um, if we approve it, the uh, committee that is, we need to, we, we will have another 30, 45 days of um, applications, which by the way, when the applications, if we do this, when the applications go out and you know people that you think should be applying, tell them to apply. It's really important. Um, so anyway, that's, that, those are the categories. I'm, um, I'm very much open to other discussion on that, Ms. Dixon. Uh, just to follow up on that, a couple points. I would suggest uh, the application process itself. We we condense the time frame so we can get the application notice posted and the applications in, and then they're reviewed, and then they're accepted in the next two meetings if possible because time is going fast. Um, one thing we talk about all of these cross jurisdictional controls that we have on our city. It would probably I would suggest that staff in their analysis of of what is the available uh, square acreage of property that's even eligible for development in this city? When you, is Banny Ranch eligible? Is the Coyote Canyon eligible? Is Newport Coast? I mean, there, there may be acreage that we can't even touch and it condenses the availability, obviously. And then just your follow-up on working with the other uh, city groups. Um, Fortunately, I am the incoming chair of ACCOC this year. I take office, I'm the first vice chair now, and I'll take office April 1st. And also I'll be in Sacramento, as will Council Member Brenner. The week after next, ACCOC is going to Sacramento, and I know on the agenda is Senator Weiner, my new best friend. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we will have a good conversation. So I look forward to uh, advancing our issues in Sacramento. Okay. Seeing no further comments up here for now, uh, let's go out to public comment. Uh, if you wouldn't mind coming up, we have two mics. Uh, you're welcome to stand at uh, the next mic over while someone else is speaking. Uh, I'm Nancy Gardner, and you're on the right track doing multi-phasing things. Um, a couple of things. 
One is we can do something a lot faster than we did last time. Uh, even though it took us almost four years, but we had months sometimes in between meetings as staff was doing other things. Uh, secondly, and I know that we don't want to have penalties, but I think it's critical if we cannot get an extension of time that we do not make that deadline the driving force. It, it's important to get it right, not just for us, but for the state. I mean, to get it right. And the examples that have been used have been examples where the state has come down hard is when the, the city has been defiant. And I find it hard to believe that if we were showing good faith and making every effort that the state would come down with its harshest penalties. And I, for one, would say, hey, if we have to pay some penalties to get it right, that's it. The second aspect is I don't know uh, when we're de as we're approaching some of these bodies whether it would be helpful to have also the environmental community chime in, because this is going to play havoc with it. It makes place havoc with the EIRs, with CEQA, uh, we talked about water and everything. And so I think that it might be, say, you know, it's not, this is not NIMBYism. This is not, this is not this at all. This is saying we, we have things we value. We want to make sure we can try to protect them. We don't want to make our city unrecognizable. And that's an environmental as well as a social issue. So uh, that's something we might want to pursue. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. My name is <clears throat> Alan Beek. I'm going to say something crazy, and I'm not going to apologize for it. We're in a crazy situation, and a lot of very valid remarks have to be made, such as Councilman Duffield and Councilman Dune have been making. But we also have to have some crazy remarks. Uh, people talk about the uh, affordable housing. Can, we, uh, can the builders build affordable housing? It's that dance and so on. Around here, it's not the cost of building the house that makes it affordable. It's the competition for the people who want to get here and live at the beach. You can't have affordable housing at the beach unless it is subsidized or unsanitary. Now, the problem is that we have people that work here and they need to live here if they aren't going to have to commute a long way. And so the effort is to try to bring the employment and the housing into balance that people in Riverside claim that they're living there to work here. And as Mr. Duffield comments, he lives here to work there. <laughs> we need to move the employment out of Newport Beach so that we can afford the houses, the people that work here can afford them. And just to do that with a crazy idea, put a tax on employment. Every time you hire an employee, you got to pay a tax for it. Not proportional to his wages. The bigger his wages, the smaller the tax. But you got to pay a whole lot if you're hiring somebody who doesn't earn much. And so that'll have the effect of moving the business out and moving the housing in. So. There are lots of good and valid things to talk about. I like Ms. Uh, Councilwoman Brenner's suggestions. We should get together and cooperate, all talk cooperatively and congenially together. That's the way to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, my name is Dennis Baker, Mayor O'Neill and Council members. Uh, thank you for going through the list. I do have a couple of additions to your list. Um, this was uh, regarding the qualifications for committee members. Uh, perhaps an architect or somebody from that area that actually has to do with that. I, if you said, I'm sorry, I missed it. And then um, seniors, I don't know if that's too narrow a category. And then um, I have a note down here, just social education, because obviously this is going to impact schools and school districts and so on. So that uh, obviously your list and those couple more is pushing it a little past the nine or ten you'd mentioned, but maybe there's some twofers in there. But also I want to emphasize, you said you were talking about the expertise, but one of the things I also want to put in there is that the person thinks like. So an attorney doesn't have to be necessarily an expert on a land use or that type of thing, but they think like an attorney or they think like a builder or they think like an economist. So that, that's from my standpoint. And then the other is just general characteristics. Um, a committee, and you've already alluded to it, and I'm just going to reiterate it, and that's, that's strong leadership. I think that's going to be extremely 
important who's going to be chairing this committee and that they, they're strong and that they can kind of keep herd those cats because you want to have also strong personalities as your people that are on the committee. And, um, but uh, they have to be strong, but then they also have to be collaborative and they have to be available, which could be another challenge. And they, this would be some of the non-specific type of, uh, you know, expertise. This is just general qualities. So um, I thank you for moving in that direction. I think it's a good direction and uh, let's go forward with it. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. And if you're planning on speaking, that's a good idea, Miss. That's a good idea, Charles. Hi, um, Mayor O'Neill and members of council, I'm Jean Watt, and I'm here to give some initial statements for residents in Spawn who are engaged in it, and we agree that being cooperative is the way to go. I mean, that will be necessary if we're gonna be successful in our city, so, so, what we're going to say, what I'm going to say, is a very simple three-minute rendition of something that needs a lot more fleshing out. But I want to applaud everybody. You've said everything already. I have very little to add that wouldn't, uh, you know, that would change the picture. It just gives you our impression of how we might uh, be part of it. Um, and also, I think that we have uh, an entirely possible agreement we can come to that would be a successful end to all this. Um, so that would take the ideal way to approach this to get to that successful end is, you've already said it, reduce the RENA number. Um, secondly, get to credit for all the housing that we have, some of which is not getting recognized. Um, Third is agree on the number of new units, having taken away the credit, gotten a new renumber, how agree among us what we think is a fair number of new units that should come online. But then those new, new units, I think it's really important that we get the best uh, amount we can get out of conversion or extension of existing housing that's already there or has been affordable and needs to be re-upped. Um, and then secondly, conversion of um, commercial to residential. We're a jobs-rich city and as been said before, um, that's where we could make some headway without adding traffic or congestion uh, but the last thing, the hard thing, is going to be to find out how to get the subsidies or philanthropy that we can use to get those conversions or to get the builders to be able to do those conversions. So that being said, for starters, first of all, we support your housing committee but we don't want the housing crisis to hijack other parts of the general plan. And that's been brought up before, the safety part, the housing, or the school part. And just for us, we want to put in the fact that we don't want to hijack the possibility of saving Banny Ranch. Okay, go, so, go ahead, Jane. you know what? I'm going to put this in writing and send it to you. And the one other thing that hasn't been said here that I would like to take the minute to add is in the list of things that we could get credit for, you've talked about a whole bunch of those, but the one we haven't talked about is the um, unaccountable units that are out there right now. And there are a lot of people living in our city, working in our city, paying low rent in units where uh, someone who owns a house or rents a unit has sub subleased. And we don't know that, we don't account for it. We could account for some of it. And I think I'm going to 
follow up on that line of thought and give you what our thoughts are as to how that could be accomplished. And anyway, thank you very much for your work on this. I'm really impressed. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good day, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Charles Klobe. First, I want to thank the, the steering committee and the staff for the work they did on the first phase, phase of the outreach process. I specifically want to call out Simone, Jim, and especially Ben. Thank you for your work. I've attended nearly every meeting and outreach and had hope that it would succeed. Committee member Tucker had been saying all along that the RENA allocation was going to drive this process. I'm sorry to see that he was right. The state mandates that confront us today probably support a change in approach to try to comply. Most residents probably want us to fight these mandates since they are so clearly unreasonable. However, the city is in an untenable position. I support the prolonged, or excuse me, the multi-pronged approach of trying to comply while simultaneously developing a reasonable argument that the mandates are overreaching. To that end, the formation of a new committee comprised of expert residents in appropriate fields seems appropriate. Ideally, in this phase, the committee should drive the process. The consultant and staff should be led by the committee and not vice versa as we have seen in the past. My ideology leans strongly to fight and not attempt to comply. However, I'm appreciative that we have not been drug into any lawsuits regarding housing like neighboring cities have. The process of compliance may be somewhat moot if a compromise is reached with SCAG and the state, that could lead us to waste money for this process. However, it appears the potential costs are much greater if we choose, if we were to lose. I commit to not critic, criticize you for this approach if we are successful at getting the methodology changed and the count reduced. Also, as Jean and others have said, we must not forget the other elements of the general plan. We must have the commitment to restart the process, the outreach process, once there is a lull in this process. Um, there are a group of members behind me that would say mostly the same thing. They've asked me in the interest of saving you time that they just stand to voice their support for what I've just said. Thank you. Thank you. That, that is a great tactic, Charles. We may need to use that in the future. All right. <laughs> All right, next speaker, please. Good evening, uh, Mayor O'Neill, council members. My name is Denise Oberman. Uh, I appreciate this conundrum. Uh, I agree that the multi-pronged approach makes a lot of sense. I'm going to make a couple of fast-track comments because I do think there are some areas that the city can take a look that will help to narrow the scope of what the city needs to fight. So first, Mayor O'Neill had mentioned or inferred that we need some data. I'd like to see some data about what we do have available without degrading our current, you know, residential zoning areas. What do we have available? And maybe it's a consultant. How do we get that the most cost effective, quickest way? I mean, maybe it's a consultant, maybe it's staff. Uh, I guess staff's been thinking about this for a while, but there are a lot of things that we know. There are areas that cannot be reused for housing because of, as was suggested, for example, contamin environmental contamination, so they're not eligible for reuse. It doesn't take a whole bunch of study to know that. Those areas are all out there. Coyote's been out there, landfill, they're super fun areas. So that's one thing. The next thing that I would suggest is to talk to somebody that understands the economics of affordable housing. We had mentioned the committee, but I would say unless the committee's gonna be formed in the next week. Target some key affordable housing, quote unquote affordable housing developers and get the benefit of their knowledge and intelligence. They're out there to make money. They're also out there in the, in the form of public-private partnerships. Let's hear from them what the actual economics could and should be. There's probably, so we can narrow our we can narrow the scope of what our real painful points are gonna be. In that 4,800 units, it may be that the market can accommodate with the appropriate developers at least half of those, at least half of them. So let's narrow it down and see where really we're gonna to have to fight. I do agree with council, former council, uh, Ms. Gardner's comments about defiant. 
Let's not put ourselves in a corner and be defiant. Let's fight with a reasonable strategy. There are other things that we can bring to bear where the environmental can coincide. Councilman Herdman mentioned, uh, mentioned public safety in the disaster zones. I do know that the state government is actually, it is in dialogue and in engagement about the concept of local government having increased responsibility to attend to prevention and mitigation for natural disasters. So where are we most prone to natural disasters? Ironically, it's the area, the coastal zone with FEMA, the fire zones. So those things, there, there is a case that aligns the city with the state to protect the public safety in those areas and not over-intensify those areas. So again, narrowing the scope without just going back and, and fostering uh, a level of defiance that's not gonna foster cooperation. Um, okay, that's it for me for now. I guess I would say that there's a lot of intelligence that can be gathered quickly. So let's identify how we can do that, narrow the scope of the effort, get some information so we can quantify exactly what it is we can do somewhat readily and what is really out of alignment. Go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. My name is Becky Adams. I'm in Mr. Muldoon's area. Thank you so much for all the work you are all doing. I, this is something that just, and this is a new thing to me. Um, I grew up in Newport Beach. I was born and raised here. I've come back now after raising my family in Laguna Niguel to see that they keep trying to pave paradise, as uh, Joni Mitchell would say. So my concern is, number one, um, good point that Mrs. Watt made, and how many of these rental units, I have at least 10 friends who have rental units above their garage, above their house. If you start adding, the, I mean, that's like one to one. You start doing those numbers and quickly you start moving up. I bet you could find 500 easily, no problem. The other thing is I grew up, in, grew up I raised my family in Laguna Niguel when it was unincorporated, and unless I am not understanding something, this is all legislature driven. And that can change based on the legislature. Because what we discovered in Laguna Niguel in 1980 when Governor Brown was in office, we were unincorporated, fought really hard to become incorporated by 1989. They had a, um, a policy, whatever it was, a ruling that 25% of all new housing had to be affordable. That meant there was even a certain of all, yeah, so therefore all the developers scrambled to build their market rate housing along Niguel Shores, Monarch Beach, and moved all that affordable housing inland to us, including a certain percentage, which was Section 8 HUD housing. We picketed, we were in the newspaper, it was not fair, and frankly, within three years, that all went away. And that all disappeared, and I think the legislature changed, and that all changed. And so Laguna, we were there for 33 years, so my point is, I would say, don't incur the fines. Do what you need to do to look like you're complying. I think your recommendation, recommendation Council Member Herdman, is excellent. Same with Council Member Brennan, all of you. But slow walk it. Slow walk the building of these things because you can have a plan as to where it could go. But don't be in a hurry to build it because it could all change based on cities being so heavily, or residents being so heavily impacted by the planning that they've tried to do in their community that's being undercut by all this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Linda Watkins, and I've been watching this process for some, some months now. And I would say that we're in a time of uh, wicked problems. And wicked problems are when there's so many problems they are converging, and there's no simple solution to it. And so the only way we know out as human beings is to truly get collaborative and really collaborate with, with the people in our community. But we also need pretty extraordinary leadership. And we do need, I agree with uh, Mayor O'Neill, that we need expertise, true expertise, I would say innovative expertise. And if we think of the general plan as overarching all of that, and the general plan process as overarching all of that and just manage it in a different way than we did in 2006, because it's a different world today, a totally different world today than it was in 2006. And so let the general plan process drive the, some of the solutions to this. If we can find solutions, there's some, they're maybe beyond us right now. 
So that's just my suggestion, that we think bigger instead of smaller, but still take care of the things like have a lobbyist or have people with expertise or whatever. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Mayor Neal and council members. My name is Nancy Scarborough. First, I wanted to thank the um, previous steering committee and also staff for the effort at the outreach. Uh, I did attend most of those public meetings and almost every outreach session, and it was a hopeful process, um, unfortunately derailed. I'd also like to thank you, the council, in advance. Um, this is bound to be a very frustrating and contentious process. I'm sure that most residents are going to be very unhappy when they become aware of what the arena numbers are and what we're being told to do, not asked to do by the state. I hope that our collective anger over this will be directed at the state representatives and not at the city council. You are only engaging in this process in a protest and the threat of repercussions by the state. We understand that. <coughs> we, the community of Newport Beach, need to demonstrate our dissatisfa dissatisfaction to Sacramento with our votes. I hope that we will all become informed and send a clear message to Sacramento with our votes in November and beyond. Um, I have two questions. They've actually been asked before, but I'll reiterate here. Uh, we would like to know and clearly understand when we will know the numbers for ADUs and a, uh, JDUs as far as what's going to be counted toward our arena number. That's really important. We have 4,800 homes at least in Newport Beach that could have ADUs, and if we can zone that way, that might take care of a lot of our concerns. And also, we would like to know conclusively that the units that are approved in the last cycle, whether they can or cannot be counted. Thank you very much for your service and listening. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, honorable mayor and council members. I'm happy to be here this afternoon to provide a few comments on an item that's being presented by council member Muldoon. My name is Linnea Shields and I'm the public affairs manager with SoCal Gas. As you may recall, back in February of 2019, I made a presentation regarding California's energy future. As highlighted in that presentation, a number of state agencies are looking at legislation to eliminate energy choice and fully electrify homes and businesses. The threat of eliminating natural gas is real and is currently being discussed among many. Sorry, just one second. Um, is this specific to the housing issues or are you, are you doing public comment on non-agenda? I'm doing public comment on non-agenda. But we haven't quite reached that point yet. Oh, sorry. my apologies. That's no, okay. No, it's I'll, okay, I'll clarify. Okay. Yep, Thank no problem, I'll, bring, I'll, make sure, I'll make sure you have the opportunity. Um, Okay, next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Terry Welsh, and I am president of the Banning Ranch Conservancy, and as always, it is a great honor to speak before the Newport Beach City Council. The Banning Ranch Conservancy, towards the end of last year, held a gala slash fundraiser event, and at that event, two important announcements were made. The first announcement, which was an earth-shattering miracle, was when Frank and Joanne Randall announced that they would donate $50 million towards the purchase of Banning Ranch. The second announcement, while not quite the extreme example of generosity, was in its own way equally important. And that was when Paolo Peroni of the Trust for Public Land announced that the Trust for Public Land had been in negotiations with the owners of Banning Ranch. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Trust for Public Land, this is a private land trust that has a sterling reputation. It has earned the trust of the landowners and the environmental community. And these talks are progressing well. Um, now, let me tell you, having worked every day for the last 21 years on Banding Ranch, you have to have a certain amount of optimism. But I can look you all in the eye tonight and tell you that I am more optimistic than ever. And I believe that Banning Ranch will be preserved as open space. So to conclude tonight, as you all move forward and plan for future housing in the city of Newport Beach, please do so with the thought that Banning Ranch will be an open space park and preserve. Thank you very much. And at the invitation of Councilwoman Brenner, we'll be back next month to give you a more thorough update. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please.
Well, good evening, Mayor O'Neill, Honorable Council. I'm Steve Ray. I'm the Executive Director of the Banning Ranch Conservancy. Just to kind of follow up with uh, Terry, we kind of split the presentation here for time purposes. Uh, yes, we uh, years ago brought in the Trust for Public Land to partner with us on the negotiations for the acquisition of Banning Ranch. The Banning Ranch Conservancy's uh, mission is to preserve, acquire, conserve, and manage the entire Banning Ranch as permanent public open space, park, and coastal nature preserve. We've been working on that for these 20 plus years, as Terry mentioned, uh, and part of that was to, to ensure that the future of Banning Ranch be indeed park and coastal nature preserve. The, the habitats, the endangered and threatened species on site, really under California law just demand that, California and state and federal law as well, demand that. So as you go through your deliberations and looking for, for uh, alternatives uh, for housing, I would just caution that uh, Banning Ranch should not be part of those considerations. Uh, if the negotiations that are going on, and I, and I will say that you might have seen the announcement uh, that the uh, public relations firm for uh, Newport Banning Ranch owners uh, put out, uh, I think it was yesterday, uh, that the negotiations are underway and they look forward to a hopefully positive outcome of the negotiations for the acquisition of Banning Ranch. So we are working toward that. Of course, the $50 million donated to us by the Randalls are certainly helping us toward that end to acquire the property. Uh, it will still take more. I, certain facts I can't uh, relate to you, but um, the next month when we come and speak to you, we will hope that we will have a lot more information that we can detail to you and uh, some maybe further announcements that uh, will help uh, elucidate what the future of Banning Ranch is gonna be. So I, I know you're in a really difficult situation. Uh, Mayor, you, you wrote an excellent letter to SCAG to uh, try to encourage uh, some redo of that. Uh, and I, we were very supportive of that letter and uh, considered maybe doing a follow-up, but I understand that that's probably not uh, uh, gonna be productive at this point. Uh, because we think that, that there are opportunities in the city, but maybe not the kind uh, to, to meet the numbers that are there, uh, certainly without Banning Ranch being part of that mix. So we look forward to working with you in the future to help identifying uh, housing areas and housing needs. Uh, it's just that Banning Ranch will, will uh, not be part of that mix should these negotiations that are uh, ongoing right now prove fruitful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, Mayor O'Neill, members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. Uh, I urge you to push back against the numbers, seek delay, and do not give up on the home rule argument. Rights are very easily lost if they're not defended. Once they're lost, they're extremely difficult to regain. Uh, Huntington Beach and Irvine are charter cities. The fact that Encinitas is having a hard time from the state is not really surprising to the best of my knowledge. Encinitas is a general law city that is obligated to follow the state's laws. They are not a charter city as far as I know. We should not give up on that argument. I also hope we will push back against the idea that growth is good. This seems to be a philosophy that we're hearing from the state. We need to grow. I don't know why, somehow we need to. Uh, we actually, we pay Beacon Economics to come here and tell us that story. We need more jobs, we need more people, we need more everything. And Visit Newport Beach tells us we need more visitors, more, and the good times will roll. I do not think that that is a good philosophy, primarily because it's fundamentally a philosophy that's at odds with, incompatible with the idea of a sustainable future. You cannot be arguing for constant growth and a sustainable future at the same time. And sustainability is something we said from the beginning we wanted to build into our new and improved general plan. Yet we seem to be embarrassed that California's growth is slowing down. SCAG has been asked, if you've looked at the numbers, only a small amount of the 1.34 million is actually growth that we anticipate to happen. We're being asked to build the Skag region, not just us, 
being asked to build vastly more houses than we expect people to occupy them. It's a philosophy that we need to lower property values so that more people will come to California. I do not know why such a philosophy is in our interest, so I do hope you will push back against it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, Larry Tucker. Um, I uh, um, am a, a fan of moving forward on a political side uh, more than the legal side. I just think that uh, when you get involved with uh, the legislature, the only issue that, that really exists is do they have the power to do what they did, not whether it was wise. I do think you need to look at the legal aspect, but I would stress the political aspect. Um, in terms of the credits that the, uh, that the city will get or not get, I think that's going to be a, uh, an issue that's going to drone on for a while. Uh, so I think that the, uh, the committee that you're going to form should be focused on the sites that would uh, potentially house um, um, or be accommodated, uh, accommodating for housing. You're going to find, I believe, that you have a, a lot more units to find places for than you'll have places to find. Um, but I do believe that the, uh, that the way that it ought to be approached is that the committee ought to, ought to prioritize and come up with as many sites as possible, come up with as uh, many units as possible to the extent that the effort to get clarity on the uh, credits that, that, uh, that are received or to reduce the RENA requirements, which is, you know, they're, they're absurd, uh, then uh, you know, they just drop off the list. So you have a priority that, that goes along. And, uh, you know, if it ends up that we go back to 2,700 and we figured out where 4,800 units would go, you have a priority, you just lop off the last 2,000 units. Um, in terms of qualifications, I, I really do believe that it's uh, resident, residential real estate developers is the, uh, the expertise that's needed. The affordable housing developers generally come in and uh, dovetail into somebody else's project. They get a site that's completed. They negotiate their numbers, their subsidies, but figuring out whether a site can be housing in the first place really is a more of a residential um, real estate developer um, approach. Uh, I, I do believe that planning is going to be really important because, you know, if you're going to have to put in all these units, you're really going to be interested in having them look good. And, and be appropriate for the uh, for the city, and I hate to say it for the people that don't like height. When you have height, then you have more areas of open land to make a nicer project around. It's and so that's it, going to be part of the conversation. Uh, I'm not sure I heard you mention somebody from the uh, resident uh, community, resident representations. Uh, spawn certainly would be uh, one, but I think that, that that's going to be important because this is not going to work if it's not a consensus and doesn't get to unanimity. It just won't work. So everybody's going to have to realize we're, we're all in it together. It's been foisted upon us. I think the committee uh, that you form ought to be directed to focus on, on prioritizing where the units would go which is a real estate development function. And once uh, the council and the staff figure out how many units are going to have to be, then uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, drop the rest of the units. Hopefully, you'll be able to drop a lot of them. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, David Tanner, good afternoon, uh, Chairman O'Neill and members of the council. Uh, it's good to see that this is being taken very seriously by all parties, including members of the, of the city that uh, have learned about it. Uh, not to repeat what I'd written, uh, because many of you have already expressed the concerns that I came here to express tonight. I'll add a couple of new, new thoughts to this. Uh, I think the issue is bigger than the RENA number, which is a cycle. We're going to get a new RENA number in the future. Who knows, that might be even larger. Are we going to be able to accommodate it no easier than we can this time, which we can't? So I think the bigger issue here is the impact in total of the, I think it's 49 housing laws since 2017. Uh, those will, in my estimation, result in thousands more units than the arena numbers will, will, uh, will be mandated to us. Uh, we need to know what the impact of these housing laws are on our city. How many units could be built, particularly ones that the city has no jurisdiction over, but 
what is our exposure? And once we know that exposure, what is the impact to our city? Once we know that, uh, those effects will be common to all other cities and counties within SCAG. We have the argument to go to other cities, we have the foundation, and say we have this in common. It's not cutthroat, we're not fighting over who gets the allocation proportionately larger in their city. So we need to have this group effort and we need to take the raw data from the laws and say this is what it's doing to our regional infrastructure, uh, health and safety, that has to be an important point. But we also need to know, and perhaps our uh, city attorney can help us, give us guidance on what is going to beat state law, what can supersede it. I'm betting that it's health and safety concerns. I think the city has the license, the power, police power to protect health and safety and that will prevail. But again, we don't want to do this alone, we want to do this with other cities. So what can we do if we're forced to do some things? Uh, I think recommending an extension is great uh, for our housing element. We could submit a draft housing element uh, in compliance with all of the laws. If we fully comply with the laws, our housing element is going to be dysfunctional. And we can say, here's the housing element, get HCD comments on it and say, oh, by the way, it's contingent upon the state coming in and mitigating the impacts from their laws. We can also, and I think maybe a committee or some kind of a subgroup, uh, to look at the legal aspects with other cities, uh, not doing it alone because it's costly, share the burden. Uh, have the cities been afforded due process? Is, are these laws a regulatory taking? We should look at that and see. It's health and safety. We're, we're, we're in trouble. Our infrastructure isn't going to be able to accommodate what these laws will allow. So, I'll comment a little later. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good evening. I'm Hua Yanye. The only thing I want to repeat is to thank the city for your very hard work on the arena related. This just has been a whole year. I have a little suggestion on the limited water supply we have. I suggest not mentioning it because Poseidon is making progress with the regional board on the permit. Last thing we want is to get stuck with arena numbers and privatized water. Thank you. Next speaker, please. All right, seeing none, we'll bring it back. Um, yep, just give me just a moment. I want to make sure I've followed up on a couple of those. So um, I think Ms. Scarborough's questions are questions that we've had up here, and we'll, I don't think they're easily answerable, so we'll, but we need to get them at some point. Um, one thing I forgot to mention earlier, uh, permanent supportive housing, as we're addressing this through uh, on the homelessness um, side of things, we ought to be, we need to be looking especially to, at uh, permanent supportive housing zoning issues for especially that lower, a very low income. Um, let's see, uh, Mr. Baker mentioned uh, another potential for um, seniors in social education. I think the stakeholder outreach category would cover the social education side, but it's an interesting point on seniors, actually, that's a, so it's another question. If we build senior housing, which we have been, not, not the housing, but the, you know, the actual, the, um, yeah, the, the bed, are the beds, does that count as housing units under RENA? So for example, I mean, when, yeah, so we just, so for example, um, boy, I'm so, Thank you. Yeah, Kurt Olson at Museum House just came through and applied, and, and we approved at about a, a, lo, a little under 100 units or 100 units. Would those have counted toward? So, so the Vivante project would count. There are actually units. There are, there are kitchens. There is bath, and we have our Harbor Point, which is more kind of like semi-hospital type, which would not <laughs> count. So that there's, you know, it just depends on how you design these units. Okay. Yeah, it's an interesting. It's an interesting point. And so, so I mentioned economist and finance, and I, I put them together, uh, not together, but they're separate. Uh, perhaps instead of an economist, we have someone that's focused in on, uh, per, you know, unique residential opportunities such as seniors. So I'm not sure how to phrase that, but that's an that's an interesting point. All right, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great catch, by the way, on that thought. Uh, Simone, just to uh, dovetail on what Ms. Adams spoke about. 
units that are sort of above garages in the backyards of Corona Del Mar or Balboa Island or the Peninsula, well, what are they called right now? So we, we have a very limited number of these, these past granny flats that have been permitted. And I know Councilmember Brenner has mentioned this to me many times. And, you know, we went back in our records, and we don't have a big number that's actually been legalized. So we look at those currently as illegal units. We can go forward and legalize them through possibly the new ADU laws. So that's how we can count those units as towards our arena. So right now, we don't have a, bit, a large number of those as actually legal permitted. So if there's a large illegal number, we have to legalize them, and we probably can do that through our new ADU laws. So that's what I like to propose uh, formally is <clears throat> that we waive any uh, past fees or illegal um, citations they would face for having an illegal uh, accessory dwelling unit in place temporarily waive all applications for those existing units going forward so that they're incentivized to um, uh, essentially self-report and apply for the permitting. Um, and then let's, uh, let's get as many of those in the books as possible. I mean, you walk down those, the flower streets towards the, um, the Pacific side, and, and there are so many of them. I'd even be uh, in support of staff knocking on doors and promoting this program, if we could temporarily halt all permitting fees, get people to come forward, which will then save them the trouble of doing so when they go to sell the house at a later date. So I know that you can do this. I don't know, Mr. Hart, if you have an opinion on this. Um, I know that you can do uh, grace periods, um, and, and I think that would be a good way for us to uh, quickly gather up some accessory dwelling units that would uh, fulfill the, the arena requirements. So some type of, like, amnesty program. For That's right. Them. Right. Yeah. And um, we can call it... Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not going to make a joke about what we can call it, but yeah, let's uh, uh, let's let's get a formal program in place if my colleagues would support it, and um, let's draw up those numbers because those are people who are already using our services and our streets that the state and SCAG were not aware of. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. First of all, I want to thank the community who are here and, and have expressed their desire to work collaboratively collaboratively with us. We, we're all in this together. It's nonpartisan. It's totally, uh, we're all banded together to work on an issue of protecting our city and complying with state law. And it's almost like a mutually exclusive challenge, but we're going to try. One thing I wanted to ask Mr. Church is, um, it used to be on, in, or the city attorney, used to be in our charter that the city, and it was removed, we had an inclusionary provision. Do you want to talk about that, and do you know the history of that, or Mr. Campbell may know? Uh, certainly. Um, I believe it was in the prior housing element cycle around 2012, 2013. It was in our uh, subdivision ordinance. We had an inclusionary requirement uh, where projects had to provide some small percentage of affordable units. And as the projects got even smaller, we would actually would waive the inclusionary requirement and have them pay an in-lieu fee. So that entire framework uh, we removed from the municipal code um, when we did this current housing element where we had the arena of five. I guess the thought was is that we wouldn't need that tool going forward if our arena was so small. So, and we were also in a recession, so we were, uh, well, so that was an impediment to housing production. This is something that we need to look at, because what it does is, why don't you explain what it does, is that developers need, there's a certain number that the city would mandate in code, or percentage of the units? S certainly, uh, and that would be a policy choice. We could have an inclusionary requirement of projects over a certain size. They must include a certain percentage of affordable housing. That was the basic rules that we had in the past. And that would be one tool that we might need to look at so that we can help boost affordable housing production, again, on the compliance path. Well, something to consider if my colleagues agree with that. We should at least look at that. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Herdman. Something else to consider in terms of uh, notching up our numbers? I know that there are examples of rental units throughout the city where market rate rent is not being charged. I know on my street in particular, there are two units in the back, mine being one of them and a neighbor being another, who are charging rent at an affordable housing rate. And I'm wondering how much of that is going on in the city. For the purpose of helping the tenant out and for the purpose of having a good tenant, long-term tenant versus you know, charging market rate. 
can we go around and knock on doors and ask how much rent's being paid <laughs> and find additional ADUs, possibly, or low-income housing? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brenner. Um, Kevin, I've actually been working with Simone for months on this issue of our, what we call them bachelor units or um, studios in Corona Del Mar. And I calculated today a, an extremely conservative number north of the highway, and I could come up with about 300 of those. So, and, and the good thing about those is that the ones that are already being rented, it's not adding any additional people to our community. They're there, and they are the people. You know, we get into this political football kind of thing about railing against the state, but these are people that we want to live in our community. They're workers in our community. They can't afford the high-priced rents that most of us pay. And they're people that are contributing to our community, and most of them live close by. That's the reason they're living in these very small units. So, um, I mean, I think you could come up with a lot. I'd like to go through the Corona Del Mar Residents Association rather than us uh, foisting this on them. But one of the things I think we need to do is encourage people to um, register them whether they're rented or not. I have one that's not rented that we use as part of our family home. My neighbors have one that they don't rent. They use it as um, when their family comes to visit. But if we can get those people to register them and account for them, it doesn't matter to us whether they're rented or not. It matters that we can count them in our count. So I think that's, you know, that's one area that we... We can come up with a lot that way, and there's on the peninsula there are some, there on the island there are some, so there's, that's really a um, kind of an untapped resource, um, but, but I think we need to guard against making this a political football and railing against the state because, um, you know, there, there is a need for this kind of housing in our community. One of the things that I mentioned in our meeting with... Um, our assemblywoman was that I would like to see the governor and the legislature come up with a tax incentive to people to live close to where they work and perhaps a tax incentive to the governor to encourage businesses to hire people that live close to where they work. So let's not just get too caught up in just fighting about this. Let's really work to come up with some real innovative solutions. And on traffic, when you talk about innovation, um, Linda was talking about that. You know, I, I feel like we have been stuck in this constriction mode for so long now that we need people that are really thinking outside the box. And I would love to see some of the people like the railroad barons of the past that come up with a regional solution for transportation in Irvine, Costa Mesa, Newport Beach, Huntington Beach, and Laguna, that we can move people around our area without us. So we need some people that are going to really look at this as maybe an opportunity to really get some, I mean, you know, Dubai is where all the innovation takes place now. What happened to the, the innovative spirit of America where we've, we can do things and we look at innovative ways to do it? That's what I'd like to see. All right. Seeing no further uh, speaker staff, do you have enough from us to move forward? I got a couple questions about the resolution uh, that we're going to need to modify. I just wanted to recap. Um, so right now we had proposed 10 total members. I'm wondering if that number is changing or not. So it's, it's we were talking about the, the potential for a committee. Yes. We're still talking, well, nine, nine voting members in the ex officio. Okay, and I'm assuming, adding the experience, uh, you still want them to be residents of the city? Yes. And? Yeah, we're not inviting, no. Yes, that's, yes, residents, yes. Okay, and then we had a, basically a one-week turnaround for the application after uh, after the notices went out. Did, did you want anything more expedited than that? I know uh, no. Councilor Dixon mentioned something. No, no, we need, that. That's that's pretty quick turnaround. A week is, um, we need it, we need at least a week. <clears throat> I think that's all the questions I have. All right. Anything else? Yeah. All Thank right. you. 
Thank you so much, and thank you very much for being out here. Again, I'm gonna reiterate what I started at the beginning. You know this is important. You need to emphasize that to your to your neighbors and your friends because we've gotta we've got to engage on this one. So um, we'll close this item and then uh, public comments on non-agenda items. You get to go first. Let's try this again. Good afternoon, Mayor, Honorable Council Members. I am happy to be here this evening to talk to you a little bit about an item that's being presented by Council Member Muldone. My name is Linneo Shields, and I'm the Public Affairs Manager with SoCal Gas. As I mentioned, back in February of 2019, I made a presentation regarding California's energy future. Um, as highlighted in that presentation, many state agencies are looking at legislation that is eliminating energy choice and mandating fully electrifying homes and businesses. The threat of eliminating natural gas is real and is currently being discussed among many of our regulatory agencies. SoCal Gas finds this problematic and challenging for four main reasons, affordability, lack of storage, reliability, and customer choice. There will be tremendous impacts with the elimination of natural gas to our communities. Making it a little bit local and here within Newport Beach, we think about tourism, you think about your restaurants, you think about your hospitals, you think about your constituents heating their homes, heating their pools, taking a warm shower, sitting by their fireplace, and a household favorite, cooking. Everybody loves to cook with natural gas. And more importantly, some of those really important services, such as hospitals and airports. With the increase of power outages, you need an alternative source in order to help continue to run these vitally important services. In short, this resolution will help protect customer choice, local control, continue innovation, and affordability options. It must be noted that this is not a utility fight. It's quite the opposite. This is a diverse energy, in, including every energy option available to us. Electricity, natural gas, in order to help achieve California's goals. All investor-owned utilities agree in the balanced energy approach with the exception of one. I'm happy to continue to speak with all of you, provide additional information, answer any questions, and my anticipation is that this is only the beginning of a more detailed discussion with all of you. I am confident that Newport Beach will join the growing list of municipalities that have adopted the resolution. Currently, we have 116 municipalities that have adopted the resolution, with 13 here in Orange County. That's about half of the cities here in the county with you know, that number growing monthly. Thank you again for being a champion for your consideration, and I look forward to working with all of you. I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. All right, seeing none, Mr. Harp. Uh, thank you, Mayor O'Neill. The City Council will adjourn a closed session to discuss items 4 A and B, including meeting with legal counsel regarding the case entitled Ashley Watts versus Christine Maroney and meeting with real property negotiators, including the city manager, uh, assistant city manager, chief of police, and assistant police chief to provide direction to them as to price and terms of payment in regards to the properties locate, uh, property located at 20302 Riverside Drive in Newport Beach, which is owned by Carol Rich and Kathy Lennard. Thank you. Thank you, we stand adjourned until the seven o'clock meeting. All right, welcome. Uh, we are going to start the January 14th, 2020 regular council meeting. Uh, Madam Clerk, roll call please. The record will reflect that all members of council are present. Thank you very much. Mr. Harp, do we have a closed session report? Uh, thank you, Mayor O'Neill. There's no closed session report this evening. Okay, tonight we will have invocation by the Reverend Paul Capitz from Christ Church by the Sea, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Council Member Muldoon. Oh God, we give you thanks for this great nation of ours and for this city of Newport Beach and for those who govern the city's welfare. Pray for a spirit of justice and impartiality, those who 
make decisions affecting the lives of all citizens, may govern truthfulness, justice, fairness, and impartiality. Bless this city council and all who live in Newport Beach, that we all as a city may find our fulfillment as human beings created in your image and likeness. Amen. Madam Clerk. The city provides a yellow sign-in card to assist in the preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the city council. If the optional sign-in card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. The city council of Newport Beach welcomes and encourages community participation. Public comments are generally limited to three minutes per person to allow everyone to speak. Written comments are encouraged as well. The city council has a discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. As a courtesy, please turn cell phones off or set them in the silent mode. Thank you very much. Now is the time for city council announcements and oral, oral reports from city council and committee activities. Uh, you all received an email. Hopefully we can uh, cap the number at around five. If you need more, we can bring it back, bring the item back at the uh, next meeting. Mr. Herd, uh, excuse me, <coughs> Mr. Herdman. Yeah, just a few announcements. Uh, tomorrow evening at six o'clock, uh, the Carol Beak Center on Babel Island, Agate Avenue, right by the ferry, where uh, I will be hosting a uh, repeat town hall meeting that was held on December the 14th for individuals on the island who were unable to attend that meeting. Uh, the topic is island infrastructure and the many projects that have to be done over the next several years. Second announcement, uh, just before Christmas, the Babel Island Museum <coughs> in December was recognized by the Orange County Historical Commission. Uh, on hand uh, at that event were Supervisor Steele, uh, representatives from the city of Newport Beach, which included uh, Councilwoman Brenner and myself. Uh, proclamations were presented and uh, just a, a really nice event. The uh, Orange County Historical Commission held their regular monthly meeting at that event. And then uh, I represent you all on the vector control uh, board here in the county. There is a new invasive Aedes, A-E-D-E-S, mosquito in our county. Uh, you all need to be aware of that. <laughs> Nickname for this is the ankle biter. And uh, I've been a victim of that myself recently. Uh, the... Uh, uh, Board is, is forming a new uh, assessment district to raise funds to combat uh, the presence of this invasive 80s mosquito. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Dixon. Uh, yes, thank you. I've, had, I've been bitten many times. Yes, I have. Thank you for doing your good work against that mosquito. Um, I have no reports, just in the interest of saving time today. Uh, we've been away for a week, few weeks. Um, is this a time that I could... Uh, proposed an agendized item. Yes, it is. I would like to uh, ask staff to report back to council on the impact of AB5 on our employee employment situation and independent contracting that we do as a city. And I, I think a combination of you and the city attorney are looking at its proposed impact. But it's when you're ready to come back and let us know uh, what the impact is going to be if we're going to have to start hiring people, particularly in community development, where you know a lot of inspectors are, are independent contractors. I don't know the answer. So anyway, yes, it's under review right now, and um, I was planning if we have our review analysis, some analysis uh, ready uh, for our planning session. Um, oh, even I didn't know that. No, yes. that that's sufficient then. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I have no further announcements. Thank you, Councilmember Muldoon. None. Councilmember Brenner. It was such a nice, peaceful time the last month. I have almost nothing to say other than that I um, attended the Speak Up Newport meeting last week on homelessness, that our homelessness um, director spoke. Natalie Besmagian did an extremely good job. She 
everybody that I spoke to afterwards was just so impressed with her. And the interesting thing was that when she was first hired from the library, we had a few naysayers that were saying, what are they doing hiring a librarian to work with the homeless? And she just did an excellent job. So I wanted to commend her for that. And I also wanted to mention that on January the 29th, our homeless task force, my committee was the um, Education and Outreach Committee, and that was made up of Terry Moore, Jean Wagoner, and Tom P uh, Peterson. And um, they, are, they were the ones that suggested we do a mental health forum, which is going to happen on January the 29th at 6.30 p.m. here in the community room. And it was really Tom Peterson that is the expert in mental health, and he's put together a panel. It's going to be an excellent presentation. And as we all know, that's the component of homelessness that most people have the most problem with. And so I think that's going to be an excellent presentation, and I encourage people to come. Thank you. Council Member Heard. Oh, I'm sorry, Duffield. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so I attended our uh, executive watershed committee meeting, and it went well. It, wrapped up the year. A lot of these um, committee meetings that we have at the end of the year aren't very uh, complicated. Everyone's excited to get on with the holidays. And the other one was the about the same time a little bit later, but what was the water quality committee meeting with the <coughs> Councilman Herdman chairs. We had a, a, a lively debate there and worked out well. So just wanted to report that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Avery. Thank you. Um, for uh, my fellow Heights residents, I just wanted to make sure uh, we're, we're trying to get the word out at our next city council meeting on January 28th, of course, a Tuesday uh, at 4 p.m. We'll be having a study session uh, to uh, once again um, go over uh, Newport Heights uh, traffic uh, situation and uh, just get uh, more discussion going. Uh, we did this last year, and uh, we had a pretty good, um, pretty good response from the public at that time, and a good discussion, and it warrants uh, more. And uh, so the agenda will include a discussion of pedestrian and bicycle access in the Newport Heights area. City staff will discuss current conditions and the addition of pedestrian and bicycle improvements that may be considered for the neighborhood. As you can read up there, while no formal council action will be taken, the public will have an opportunity to provide input and comments. And for those of you that, again, live in the Heights, and of course everyone's invited, um, but those that have been in the Heights for the last few years are pretty well aware of um, the discussion back and forth on this, on this issue. And so um, I just encourage uh, everybody to, uh, to turn out so we can keep, uh, keep rolling and get a sense of where folks are at. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then I have a few announcements. The first is uh, at our homeless task force uh, and then uh, up through the council, we approved signs uh, encouraging people not to give money directly, but to instead give money to charities that uh, support the homeless um, in, our, in our communities. Uh, these signs have gone up. There are about six of them around the city right now. We have more ordered. If you believe that there is an intersection that uh, would do well by having these there, uh, please go. We also have our website, if you go to newportbeachca.gov slash give, uh, you'll see a list of charities that uh, uh, we think have, have done good in our community. We also have a city council planning session on Saturday, January 25th at 9 a.m. directly behind us. Uh, we are going to be discussing a year of planning, so we'll be discussing priorities and discussions and uh, a wide range of topics. This is usually between two and three hours, so if you'd like to come, it starts at 9 a.m. Uh, next, Newport Beach Foundation, their Distinguished Citizen Spring Class is accepting applications. It will close um, next week, so if you're interested in learning about uh, our civic government. And I see a lot of folks, are you, which school are you all from? CDM. Harbor. Ann Harbor. There you go. <laughs> Fantastic. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Uh, so this is, uh, this is geared toward uh, our younger generation, and, and so if you'd like to learn more, please apply. Uh, and then last but not least, I uh, was appointed uh, vice chair of the TCA San Joaquin board last week. The San Joaquin board is the 73. So looking forward to working on some finance policies there too. All right, uh, we'll move right into our, uh, excuse me, the matters which council members have asked to be placed on a future agenda. 
do I read this or do you? I can't recall. I'll read it. Um, consideration of resolution supporting balanced energy solutions and maintaining local control of energy solutions as California transitions to a clean energy future. This is recommended by Council Member Muldoon. Uh, this is a non-debatable, but uh, do I have a show of hands of people who would like to bring this back? That was uh, unanimous. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll go to uh, the consent calendar. Uh, this is a time for council members to pull any items or declare conflicts um, or make any other further votes specific to the consent calendar. Mr. Herdman. I have none. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, Ms. Dixon. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. I would like to pull item number 16, uh, the review, receive and file on homelessness. I, I think it would be important for the community to just get that update. <coughs> All right, item 16 has been pulled. Uh, Councilmember Muldoon. Yes, on item number six and item seven have the same conflict due to business interests and telecommunications industry. I guess that these uh, conceptualize some sort of undergrounding component for telecom. Okay, Councilmember Brenner. None. Councilmember Duffield. None. Mayor Pro Tem Avery. I have none. I'm gonna pull item number five and then um, Need to make one change on item 14, which is annual mayoral appointments. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm gonna suggest that uh, Council Member Dixon be vice chair of the Aviation Committee um, in place of uh, Mayor Pro Tem Avery. All right. Oh, uh, Mayor O'Neill. Oh, I'm sorry, we have a continuance, you're right. Um, Agenda item 15. And then uh, agenda item number 15 is will uh, as a staff recommendation for continuance. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I move the balance of the consent calendars, calendar items one through 17 with the exception of the following items. Number 16 pulled by council member Dixon. Item five pulled by mayor O'Neill and recusals from council members Muldoon on item six and seven, and a continuance on item 15. Do I have a second? All right, I get seconded by council member Muldoon. Uh, we'll go out to public comment, public comment on non-polled consent calendar items. All right, seeing none, we'll bring it back. Uh, let's vote. The motion carries unanimously, 7-0. Okay, uh, we'll go in numerical order of it being pulled. We'll uh, start with item number five. Um, I asked for this to be pulled uh, simply so that uh, we could have a, dis we could just do a little bit of public awareness on what the uh, state legislation uh, that has been passed. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to recuse myself. Real property interest, thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, I've asked for this item to be pulled so that we can just do a little <laughs> bit of public awareness on what the uh, California legislation is changing in terms of ADUs uh, so members of the public can see it. it. This should be fairly fairly concise, but I would like to, I wanted to make sure I did that, so Mr. Jurgis. Thank you, Mayor O'Neill. <clears throat> Simo and Jurgis, Community Development Director. This item before you is just the initiation to update our codes to match state law. Um, Principal planner Jaime Murillo here, he's the, he's the expert on our ADUs for our city, so he has maybe a six slides and he'll go through it relatively quickly. Thank you, Simone. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, as mentioned earlier today in today's study session, last year uh, there was a number of housing bills passed by the state. Uh, there's three housing bills in particular that uh, affect the city's ability to restrict accessory dwelling units, and that's requiring us to update uh, both our zoning code and our local coastal program to um, revise the regulations to comply with state law. Uh, before I get into the changes, I just want to explain the difference between an accessory dwelling unit, which we refer to as ADU, and a junior accessory dwelling unit, which we refer to as JADUs. So ADUs are um, separate independent living units. Uh, they're allowed to have up to two bedrooms. Um, they're not they do not have internal connections between uh, the principal unit and the ADU, and they can be developed as either uh, detached living units on a property, they can be attached to the principal dwelling, or they, be, they can be created through the conversion or repurposing of the existing space. Uh, 
junior accessory dwelling units are new and the city is now required to allow for the development of these types of units. Uh, they're still considered independent living units. However, they are restricted to a maximum size of 500 square feet. Uh, they're different and unique from an ADU in that they can have an internal connection to the primary unit. They can also share a bathroom with the primary unit. Uh, they're only allowed to be constructed through the conversion of uh, existing space or as part of a new single family uh, dwelling. And they're allowed to have an efficiency kitchen, which is a really small um, kitchen, which essentially just needs a requirement for any kind of cooking appliance and some uh, small kitchen area. How the law affects our current ordinance is kind of broken down on the table on the slide. Uh, so our existing rules are located in the first column and what will have to change to comply with state law is listed in the second column. Uh, so in terms of location, our current regulations only allow accessory dwelling units on properties uh, that allow for single family uh, development. Under the new rules, uh, any property uh, that has single family or multifamily or mixed use uh, now has to allow for accessory dwelling units. In terms of the number of units allowed, under the previous rules, only one accessory dwelling unit was permitted. Uh, with the new rules on single family properties, uh, one accessory dwelling unit and one junior accessory dwelling unit can be developed on a single property. Uh, so essentially, you can have up to three units on one single family property. With regards to multifamily developments, the number of units is a formula that's up to 25% of the existing units in an apartment complex. So on a 10 unit apartment complex, you could have um, up to two or three units uh, used for accessory dwelling units. And this would have to be repurposed from existing space. And the example they use is boiler rooms or a garage or um, like a common area. It also allows for two detached units on a multifamily property. Uh, they did away with our, allowance, our, our ability to regulate minimum lot size. Under the old rules, we did have a requirement for a minimum 5,000 square foot lot area. Uh, the state law did away with that, so we can no longer uh, restrict minimum lot size. Uh, maximum unit size has also been uh, Revised so where we previously were allowed to regulate unit size up to 750 square feet uh, They've now established a maximum limit for 850 square feet for a one-bedroom unit and up to thousand square feet for a two-bedroom unit and then junior accessory dwelling units are restricted to 500 square feet uh, In terms of our height uh, We can still regulate height per our standard zoning requirements, but in the case of a detached accessory dwelling unit uh, they've limited the maximum height to our ability to restrict it to 16 feet, where we previously restricted them to 14 feet. Uh, they also modified our ability to regulate setbacks for detached accessory dwelling units. Uh, before, we had to allow for a minimum five foot setbacks for ADUs above a garage. Uh, now, under the new rules, we have to allow for four foot side and rear setbacks for detached accessory dwelling units. Another major change is the requirements for owner occupancy. Under the old rules, we could require that either the principal unit or the ADU be um, occupied by the owner of the property. And under the new rules, and this is a, a temporary requirement for uh, five years, so until 2025, we can no longer require owner occupancy. So essentially, um, a developer could purchase property and develop an ADU uh, and a principal residence and rent them both out. Another change, oh, sorry. And then the one other major change is um, the old rules, you could convert a garage into an accessory dwelling unit, but we could require that that parking that's being displaced be replaced on that property. Under these new rules, there's no replacement parking required. So someone could convert a garage and not have to replace the parking. So those are the major changes uh, that we're going to be addressing as part of this code update. Okay, and so just to be clear, uh, we're not voting on a code update tonight, uh, but these rules that the state has put in went in effect January 1st, if I recall correctly. Right, so the, these rules are in effect. Um, our existing ordinance is rendered null and void. 
and we have to implement state standards. There's very minimal uh, modifications we can make, which we are working on. We'll bring it back to the Planning Commission for review and a public hearing, and ultimately a recommendation back to the City Council. Okay, and um, well, one last thing. Uh, Mr. Tanner asked uh, a number of good questions by email and, and writing um, that uh, should be addressed certainly through the, uh, the planning process itself. So. Um, in order for us to initiate this, we have to vote to initiate a code change, and then when uh, what will happen is it will go through um, the Planning Commission, and then it will come to the Council, at which point we would either adopt or not adopt the code changes. But I wanted everyone to see what currently is in place, thanks to uh, state legislation dealing with ADUs. Um, Ms. Dixon. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, per your comments, we have no choice. This is another of many mandates. Uh, but speaking on behalf of District 1, the Balboa Peninsula, and Mr. Tanner, you mentioned his comments. And uh, during high season summer days when traffic is bumper to bumper and there are emergency issues, now we're going to be, which is going to be in an exacerbated situation because there's no parking <laughs> parking requirements or garage parking requirements. Or, and uh, so this is clearly going to be a trend going forward as to what's coming from the state in terms of eliminating parking requirements, but in areas where we are already congested, um, it just is going to exacerbate a limited parking situation and perhaps uh, affect our emergency response systems. My point in commenting is let's, these, uh, there's been a total of three laws that have been passed since I've been on the council, and they've all happened without us realizing what's going on, frankly. I mean, honestly, I wasn't paying attention. And so going forward, I think this is just one of many new types of state mandates that are coming down to tell the cities how to regulate housing and land use, that let's keep, let's keep ADUs on our watch list because I can predict there'll be more loosening of these restrictions that have helped us manage our congested, crowded, residential areas that are only going to get more crowded and congested. So thank you. All right, thank you. Seeing no other questions up here, go out to the public. Mr. Tanner. Thank you. David Tanner. A uh, couple of questions to add to the questions that I asked staff to address. Um, how will these uh, new ordinances affect short-term beach rentals? I know that was a concern of the city also its impact on our commercial hotels uh, that is another concern and with the new ordinance are we going to try and achieve anything other than state compliance i know previously city passed two ordinances that tried to limit regulate where these could occur the way i read the laws right now uh, it's in any residential area there could be thousands and thousands of additional units built uh, so I'd uh, ask staff that they look at these issues and report back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tanner. I, I think, I'm sorry. Continue. Next speaker, right. please. Charles Club again. Um, a somewhat rhetorical, a question for Jaime. The way I understand it, a person could buy a single family lot in Newport Beach, tear down the old house, build three units, rent them at market, and they would not count towards our arena allocation. Is that correct? Thank you. Next speaker, please. All right, uh, bring it back. Uh, second question first. That's one of the questions we're going to need to ask and get clarification on. Uh, the first question, the, the, the questions from uh, Mr. Tanner. Good points. I will just say maximize local control. That's, that's as good as we can do when we're, when we're bringing this back. So I appreciate the comments, and uh, we'll stay together. So I'll, since I pulled it, I'll make the motion to approve staff recommendation. Do I have a second? Seconded by Council Member Duffield. Any discussion? All right, let's vote. The motion carries 6 0. All right, just take a moment to let Mayor Pro Tem Avery come. All right, item number 16 pulled by Council Member Dixon. Uh, would you like a staff report? Uh, the per thank you, Mayor. The purpose of me uh, pulling this is to follow up on Councilmember Brenner's comment that we had an excellent presentation on our homeless situation by Speak Up Newport the other night and Ms. 
Basajian, if I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, uh, gave an excellent presentation. And I didn't know, well, Ms. Lung, or if you want Carol or someone to give an update on homelessness, I thought the staff did a great job and just thought it would be good information sharing with the communities instead of just receiving in file, just, just give a quick update of where we are in homelessness. Thank you. Sure, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Carol Jacobs, your Assistant City Manager. Um, we, staff continues to work on a multi-pronged approach for our housing, um, our homeless issue. Um, a couple of things that we've done over the past couple of months has been, um, as M where Mayor O'Neill said, was the uh, no panhandling signs. Um, unfortunately, some of those have already been defaced and we're having to um, keep an eye on them to make sure that, um, that they remain uh, intact and uh, send our message. Um, we've, we've updated our website with lots of good information about homeless resources and, and places where folks can go to get information and provide Natalie a contact if it's a business or a resident and they're having an issue or concern with a, a homeless individual that they have a resource to reach out to. Um, we are going to continue um, with the ad hoc committee's uh, goal of establishing monthly forums or seminars on homelessness so that we have um, we can educate our community to many of the um, issues that are going on. We're looking at, um, in February, having a, a speaker on um, children who are homeless. And we think that might be a very a very good subject to, to bring to the community. We're also continuing to look for additional partnerships. Um, we've had several meetings with the United Way at staff level and SOS uh, to see how we can best partner with them to, to get our folks um, resources. We also are um, in highly engaged with um, the county in their very convoluted system of care and getting folks um, into the system so that we can get them housed. Um, Natalie has done an excellent job of uh, working directly with CityNet and making sure that we're understanding exactly what they're doing on the street. And um, we've had a lot of nice um, success stories. Um, gentleman here who has spent a, a number of years at our library uh, been homeless for 30 years, was finally housed in Anaheim. And uh, Natalie relayed to me that she got a very nice phone call from him saying how grateful he was and that he was on the road to recovery and um, uh, looking for a job. And so it, it's really been a very nice, um, it's nice to hear those one-off success stories. And we've had a number of those. And so I think that is really, the goal of this is to get people housed. And um, we've also created an internal um, what we're calling a rapid response team, which has got representatives from every city department. We're educating our staff that when they see a homeless person, it doesn't have to be just Natalie or a police officer. If it's our public works department, our fire department, um, they know who to call to get that person the resources that they need. Um, and so that's, that's a thumbnail sketch of what we've been working on, if that's helpful. If I could just add on just real briefly, I think we have the individual one-on-one -on -one, um, assistance that we're really focused on. And on top of that, we are also continuing to look on the shelter side and the permanent supportive housing piece too. And we'll have a little bit more of a discussion at this at the planning session. I was planning to bring back, um, talk about the next steps in terms of moving forward with some looking at developing permanent supportive housing um, you know, in our city. Um, and in addition to that, we continue to look at the, the shelter space side too and really um, work towards uh, potentially a regional solution there. So um, talks are continuing amongst cities um, in that arena too. Well, uh, very good. And haven't you also said that we now, in conjunction with CityNet and staff, have really done a complete inventory of known homeless in our community. So we are dealing with homelessness, one homeless at a time. Yes. So thank you very much. All right, Council Member Brenner. Um, I just wanted to say if the gentleman that used to be here at the library needs a letter of reference, there are probably a lot of people in our community that would be able to do that for him. He really won the hearts of a lot of people around here. He was so courteous and he was so articulate, and I think it just really makes people feel good that we've been able to help him. So that's a real win-win. And the other thing I wanted to say about the panhandling sign is that we phrased that in a way to be as delicate as possible. Obviously, we're not just telling people not to give to panhandlers because it's everyone's right to do what they want with their resources. But as my ex-husband, who was an educator, used to tell me, behavior that goes unrewarded is extinguished. So the more we can encourage people to give to those organizations that are really helping people um, and, and to not give to individual panhandlers, 
it really, it, they're not going to keep doing it if they're not getting a reward for it. So we just have to encourage people to help in a legitimate way. All right, thank you. I'll just note real quickly, uh, the Speak Up Newport event last week was about an hour long presentation, covered a lot more than we can cover right now. Uh, it's on our city website. If you search NBTV, really encourage all of you to watch it. Seeing no further discussion up here, any public comments on this item? All right, we'll bring it back. Um, as a receive and file, do we need to vote, Mr. Harp? No, I don't think you do. Okay, all right. Sorry, just give me one moment then. All right, this is the time for public comments on non-agenda items. Uh, if you'd like to speak on a non-agenda item, please come forward. Good evening, Mayor O'Neill, uh, council and staff. My name is Jose Trinidad Castaneda, and I'm with the Climate Action Campaign. I'm here to provide an update uh, regarding the Irvine-led Community Choice Energy effort. Uh, some of you may know that Community Choice Energy is a program that is about returning local control to cities uh, that partner together to handle the procurement of energy. And so currently we have a, mon a monopoly system with SoCal Edison uh, where they buy uh, energy for us and charge us a little bit more uh, to uh, send, that, send that our way. But with a community choice energy, it's really cities uh, standing up and saying, we're partnering together to leverage our power as cities so we can control the, the rates and lower costs for our residents and businesses. And so really this is an outstanding opportunity to combine a lot of your efforts uh, with the general plan. You can meet state requirements on energy and emissions, but also really reduce uh, rates for all your residents and businesses and have more local control over how uh, revenue and energy savings are reinvested back in the community. From what I understand, there are a lot of electric vehicle uh, car owners in Newport Beach that would really stand to benefit from new EV car, uh, charging infrastructure or I mean, public car infrastructure. So these are some of the examples. And we know that in Irvine, uh, Council um, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Michael Carroll is uh, leading an effort to make sure that we invite all cities. So again, my name is Jose. I'm open to partnering with you all to provide education and information as it comes forward. And you have an opportunity to respond to the city of Irvine, which sent a letter last Friday uh, to ask whether you're interested. So you can send it as individual council members or um, just uh, direct city staff to respond. And that way, uh, more information can come your way so you can make the best available decision for your city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, my name is Ryan Reza Farsai. Uh, congratulations, Mayor O'Neill. Uh, any relations to the O'Neill family and the land barons, original land barons of the Mission Viejo Company? Uh, no. <laughs> That'd be nice, but no. I'm a prior, prior employer of one Donald Brent, my fraternity brother. Uh, I'm here to speak about the code of conduct in the United States. A little bit disappointed with the politics. As you know, I've been coming here for the last year plus. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a re Republican. I'm an American. I'm not a donkey or an elephant. I'm a lion, a diamond in the rough. So I'm not a lawyer or a billionaire, or am I? Most lawyers and billionaires in the United States have heard about me by now. If they, not, if they haven't, they will. I'm not voting in the election unless I voted for myself. My concern is the division or the intelligent modern day civil war that's taking place in the United States. The children of the United States and the globe are the victims. The environment is the victim. The animals are the victims. I have no fear of anyone. I do fear the Lord and Mother Nature. Mother Nature can and will equalize at any time. At any time, the ground can swallow us. This is California, and we do live in the Pacific, by the Pacific Ocean, and close to the San Andreas Fault. We do have a live volcano on Mammoth Mountain, even though people are paying millions of dollars for condos up there. My goal in my lifetime is to be a role model for my child and all children. Address the homeless issue in Los Angeles, California, United States, and the world. 
help the mind, body, soul, spirit, and heart of all veterans in the United States and globally. I'm just one person, but my efforts will be dynamic and global. But it requires a collaborative effort. January 12th was Swami Vivekananda's birthday. He says, where do we go look for God if we cannot find it in our own hearts? Next week on Monday is Martin Luther King holiday, January 20th. And he says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Our direction and the path in the United States is an injustice to the children, to mother nature, the trees, the plants, the animals. That is my opinion. That's why I'm up here tonight. My goal is to get you to start thinking about this stuff, because what are you going to do to help? I did send a letter to the Federal Reserve chair. I said, hey, why are you signing off on like having homes being built on dirty property when 20 years later, 30 years later, the children over there have problems or they're going to school on these properties? And they sent me a letter back saying, you need to talk to your council members. So I'm here to talk to you guys. You need to talk to your politicians. My objective is to try to get you guys to think about this stuff because this is California and they're building on the last pieces of land there is, but are they building on clean property or not? That is a concern for all the children. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. God bless America. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Tim Stokes. I'm uh, president of the Friends of Newport Beach Animal Shelter, so I represent the four-legged friends in our community. Just wanted to tell you about our success for 20, 2019. We were able, as we do our public private partnership with the city to provide uh, additional medical care, uh, additional um, special cages, um, great stories for the animals in our shelter. And our fourth um, pillar is to provide a, a permanent home for the shelter. Last year we were successful in not even um, opening our capital campaign, so we feel like our bank account has enough to sustain us to purchase that facility now. So we're in the process of, of doing that for the city and then uh, gifting that as a, a, um, um, an asset from the community uh, of Newport Beach's residents. Um, since our membership drive of last year, we're about 500 members, so that was a pretty good six-month success. So 500 of our fellow, stu our fellow members of the community, including some of the council people and, and uh, 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 Mr. Mayor Dixon, pardon me, Diane, we, we sure appreciate your, your starting this campaign with us and, and uh, for the four-legged friends of our community and uh, um, th then Mayor Muldoon who signed our agreement for the shelter. So we appreciate you starting this all off and I think uh, as now we have great success to, to find that uh, asset for our community and then going forward we have aspirational issues. Uh, um, um, aspirational ideas of, of being able to fiscally support the shelter from a financial contribution to as well with many of our um, estate donors and stuff so congratulations to the city of Newport Beach for on its animal shelter thank you next speaker please all right seeing none we'll bring it back just um, quick note on the uh, first speakers discussion about community choice energy I did receive a letter from uh, Mayor Shea asking if we were interested uh, consistent with uh, prior comments out in the public, we're going to say yes, we're interested. Devil's in the details very much on this issue, so just FYI, you don't have to send back any individual letters. We'll express our interest. All right, um, coming forward to current business, item 18. Uh, this was a good staff report. Is there a uh, request for staff report on this one? No, any discussion or questions? All right, seeing none, uh, any public comment on the item? Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. My name is Kevin Snow, and with me is my sister, Kim Kerstead. We are the owners of this property. This is our family home, and it's currently occupied by my sister and her family. I'd like to say, thank the City Council and City staff for taking the time to visit the location and get to understand the site. This project is very important to us, and we agree with staff's recommendation to waive the City Council policy L2. However, additionally, we request the City Council consider the option in the staff report for the additional covered non-tandem off-street parking space beyond code to be optional. The basis for this requirement is the premise that the loss of a parking spot 
what occurred due to the curb cut. This makes sense in most cases. However, in this case, the curb is red and there's no loss of a parking spot. So therefore, there really is no reason to require us to have five parking spots instead of four. Um, this requirement costs a lot, will cause a loss of approximately 325 square feet of living space on the ground floor. As is, the design program requires small living spaces. Modern designs attempt to provide options to age in place and ground floor living space is very important to this concept. As long-term residents of Newport Island, <clears throat> excuse me, it's essential for us to build an aesthetically pleasing home that is in harmony with the current architecture and is a complement to the community. And that really is our goal. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank you for all the hard work you do on this project and many, many more that we've seen tonight and many more in the future. Thank you again. We are happy to answer any questions that we can. Thank you very much. Um, given that this is the applicant, are there any questions people would like to, uh, I'm sorry, you know what, I apologize. I'd like to find out if anyone else would like to do public comment before we ask any questions. Thank you. Do we have any other public comment on this item? All right, seeing none. Um, if you have questions, actually, I'm sorry, why don't you come on back up just in case uh, the questions may be directed to staff, they may be directed to you, uh, Councilmember Dixon. Thank you, Mayor. Just to, good evening. Just to clarify the, requ the request that staff has said to include one additional covered non-tandem off-street parking space, and your request is to make that optional. Would you seriously make that optional? I mean, you'd consider it as far as uh, square footage is concerned? Well, uh, optional means we could take it under consideration. If it, if it did not work with our design, then we would not include it. That's what that's what we're saying, and that's what was recommended as one of the options in the staff report. And just to clarify, too, so each of your units will have two parking spaces, correct? Correct. correct. And, and you will not be there's not enough room to park in the alley. Well, there's going to be a five foot setback. So we did some research on that. They, these guys currently drive the uh, electric Fiat, and they'll fit. And, but, but what that will allow to do is a, is a very small car or also golf carts and some of the other types of vehicles that uh, are used on the peninsula regularly. So that would be still on your property Absolutely. Then, and They'll not still obstructing the alley. Correct. Okay, very good, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Muldoon. Just wanna confirm applicant statements are correct that that's a red curb being cut? That's correct. Okay, I'll make a motion to approve staff's item with request an applicant being granted. Well, I'll second it, I was, I was gonna make a motion, but okay, go ahead, and I second yeah. it. Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, we have a motion and a uh, second. Let's vote. That's okay. Back to the same place. The motion carries unanimously, 7 0. Thank right. you, Council. Thank you very much. Um, on to the next item, item number 19. Uh, again, good staff report. Any request for a uh, staff presentation? Okay. Seeing none, any discussion questions? Seeing none, we'll go out to the members of the public. Any public comment on this item? Seeing none again, we'll bring it back. Do I have a motion? All right, uh, moved by Councilmember Muldoon, seconded by Councilmember Duffield. Let's vote. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for ordinance number 2020-1, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach, amending sections of chapter 12.24 of the Newport Beach Municipal Code regarding increasing and decreasing state speed limits. The motion carries unanimously, 7-0. All right, thank you. Um, item, uh, item number 20, let me just give a quick preface to item number 20. Um, we won't be asking for a staff presentation on this. For everyone who wasn't here, we spent two hours talking about this particular issue, not this particular item, but the, the issue of regional housing needs assessment, um, very high level. Uh, we have 45,000 housing units, which is anything from a condo how, to, a, to a large house, um, apartments and everything in between. Uh, we have, so we have 45,000 housing units currently in the city after existing for over 100 years. State of California has told us very recently we need to zone for 4,800 more housing units over the next eight years. Uh, we are trying to figure out how to do that, and we're also trying, as we discussed during the study session, uh, paths for uh, pushing back. So uh, what's in front of us right now is a, uh, is a committee to help us 
try to figure out how to comply with that um, that number and so that is the discussion we also discussed quite a bit what this particular uh, committee would look like if we were to move forward including expertise that we've requested in front of us uh, in front of each council member as a red line and then mr. Harper are they available as well uh, yes there's some available in the lobby all right, so I want to just make sure I go through very briefly for members of the, my council and then also members of the public. I'm going to read the, not all the changes, but I'm going to read the changes for the categories. Uh, this is the qualifications that we discussed. One member with experience in the development of affordable housing, one member with knowledge and experience in the application of the California Environmental Quality Act and other related environmental laws. One member with knowledge and experience in transportation analysis and or circulation planning. One member with architectural and or land use and planning knowledge and experience. One member with knowledge and experience in stakeholder outreach for the purpose of engaging individuals and or organizations within the city in the housing element update process. One member with knowledge and experience financing affordable and or senior housing projects. One member... Uh, that's not quite right. One member with knowledge and experience financing unique housing projects other than affordable and or senior housing projects. One member with a legal background and one chairperson highly experienced in leading public comments. I'll just make a quick note um, on F. Uh, the goal was not quite to find someone with knowledge and experience fi financing the projects. It was just simply res um, real estate financing in general. Uh, so the and then the um, uh, and then under G, the the purpose of G was not to focus on someone who had uh, knowledge financing that. It was just simply someone with uh, experience with unique housing projects such as affordable or senior senior housing. So the purpose of um, F was to have someone with knowledge of financing. The purpose of G was to have someone who understood unique housing projects such as senior housing. So we'll change it to read one member with knowledge and experience in real estate financing. That'll be F. And then G would be one member with knowledge and experience uh, in unique housing, such as affordable and or senior housing projects. Or uh, unique housing. Uh, so I would actually say unique housing projects, such as senior housing, period. Like that, did you, because we've got someone, we, that's, that's the purpose of um, A. So, okay, well, that's why we do this. All right, okay. Council Member well, Dixon. Uh, well, didn't, didn't we also say residential housing? Yep, so that's the, so the point of, we, when we said residential, we were actually just talking. General residential. Big ones, right? Yeah, financing re general residential. Yeah, exactly. So we've got, we've got planning and development and whatnot covered. So where is that? I guess I'm not seeing that. Oh, you mean developing residential what, what are the in criteria? general? Yeah, to have that. Isn't that what Larry Tucker was recommending? That's a good point. That might we might need to just. You know what? I'll tell you what. That's a fair point. Take G, the reference to senior housing, add it into. Um, I think we can add that into A. Frankly, so preferably someone with affordable housing and or senior housing experience, um, and then uh, G can be, uh, you know, knowledge with of how to do residential development. Is that what you're thinking? Yep. Okay. Any other comments as we went through that? Okay. Um, then what we'll do is, uh, before I go out to the, the public, have members of the public who would like to speak had sufficient time to read the red line? Raise your hand if you haven't. Do you want some more time? Here, come on up, Charles. Well, you know, we'll go out to the, sorry, I didn't want to open it until you, people felt comfortable, but I'll open public comment that. on this I item. I just want to make sure the resolution takes out the uh, possible change to 423. Yeah, that's a, that wasn't in the resolution, I believe that was in the staff report. Staff report, but. So we, we were, um, yeah, we're not putting that in the resolution or the qualifications. Fair enough? Yeah. Okay. Any other public comment on this item? Okay, we'll bring that back. Um, so, uh, with uh, with the changes, the as could you please read the modified changes to make sure we've got them? 
Okay, so A will be one member with experience in the development of affordable housing and or senior housing. G will, will be one member with knowledge and experience with residential development. And I, I'm sorry, and I skipped F. F will be one member with knowledge and experience in real estate financing. Okay, and I'll just note, I don't know that we need to put this in for the qualifications, but I would just note on number, on A, just A, I'll just note, I think we need to um, have an emphasis, we, we need to have a preference for someone with affordable housing, but so the and or, uh, it's, it'd be helpful, but we should, when we're voting up here, I would just suggest we have a preference for someone with affordable housing. Okay, any other questions or comments? Well, I have a comment still, um, separate from this particular resolution. Are we considering the whole item before us? We are considering the whole item before us. Um, although the, the purpose of this would be, uh, oh, I'm sorry, yes, we are, go ahead. All right, so in addition to this separate item that's part of the same action this evening, I'd like to add an item D and propose that while I know that you, the mayor, have already sent a letter expressing the city's position on the arena numbers, I think as part of this item that we're considering now, we should direct staff to return with a formal resolution opposing the modified regional housing need assessment allocation methodology by the Southern California Association of Governments Regional Council. I know we've put in the letter, other cities have been issuing or voting and passing resolutions, and so just to record it emphatically where the city of Newport Beach stands on this item, on this issue. So I would respectfully ask to be included. I guess that's a motion I'm making. A, Do you, you know, mind if I make the motion? Go right ahead. Okay, there's there's something in specific I need to make sure we right. include in it. So and then include this if you would. Yes. You bet. I will do that. So um, I move staff recommendation of A, uh, B, C as amended. Direction under, uh, oh, there's C, yeah, I'm sorry. There's two Ds. Yeah, there there's two Cs. Yeah. Okay, hang on one second. Let me just. Let, e. All right, let me fix this. I move staff recommendation of A, B, C as amended. What should have been D with direction that we not bring back any suggestion of amending section 423 and E as described by council member Dixon. Do I have a second? I'll second. All right, seconded by council member Herdman. Any debate? All right, let's vote. Motion carries unanimously, 7-0. All right. Uh, last item, item number 21, uh, appointment to the Visit Newport Beach Incorporated Executive Committee. Do we have any of the applicants here? I know Mr. Mosier, you're here. Anyone else? Okay. Um, just for the education of my fellow council members, uh, we had three applications. We chose not to um, interview because we were not going to cut down at all. Uh, so we've put the full, all, all applications for this position before us. Um, and uh, before we make any votes, we need to um, go out to public comment. Are there any questions at all up at the dais? Okay, seeing none, we'll go out to public comment on this item. Is there any public comment? So recognize I sent the letter late, although it's out here at the door. Of course, I'm supporting Jim Mosher for this position. As I've said to you and I'll say publicly, there's not a person in this city that dedicates more time um, volunteering for the city. And he's applied for many things, and he's probably embarrassed that I'm standing here, but I hardly support Jim for this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on this item? All right, seeing none, we'll bring it back up. Um, just so everyone who hasn't attended a council meeting before, we actually vote on paper ballots, and then I will vote in just a moment. Uh, we vote on paper ballots, and then uh, our city clerk collects them, and then she reads off the tallies. Councilmember Duffield votes for Sharon Wood. Councilmember Brenner, Jim Mosier. 
Council Member Herdman, Sharon Wood. Council Member Dixon, Sharon Wood. Council Member Muldoon, Sharon Wood. Mayor Pro Tem Avery, Jim Mosier. Mayor O'Neill, Sharon Wood. So that's five votes for Sharon Wood, two votes for Jim Mosier. So that comes into play Council Policy A2. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we will, uh, motions for reconsideration, Madam Clerk. Oh, we need to decide, does um, Sharon Wood need to resign from Civil Service Board or uh, not? Thank you very much. All right, so uh, Mr. Harp, could you please just briefly explain the issue? So our council policy, in essence, says that you should only be on uh, one committee at a time. Sharon Wood's currently on the Civil Service Board, uh, so it creates a little bit of a conflict, so that she'd be on two boards. So the recommendation is to waive council policy A2, which would allow her to remain on the Civil Service Board as well as be on uh, the Executive Committee. In your opinion, Mr. Harp, is there any situation where being a member of the Civil Service Board would come into conflict with being a member of the VNB Executive Committee? I don't believe so. All right, um, do we have any discussion up here? Do we have any public comments on that particular issue? All right, seeing none, we'll bring it back. Do I have a motion? All right, Mr. Avery moves uh, Mr. Harp's recommendation. I'll second. Uh, any discussion? All right, let's vote. And you're voting to waive council policy A2. With with council member Herdman voting no, the motion carries 6-1. All right. Um, oh, may, Madam Clerk? Oh, may, Mayor O'Neill? Oh, yes. if, I, if I might, could I just make a quick um, just introduction? Um, tonight is the first uh, council meeting for our new uh, public information officer, John Pope, who's out um, in the audience right there. So I just want to briefly just uh, introduce him. Um, I know he's sent out some, some posts too, and, and you'll, um, the members of the community will see more of him, I think. Um, but we're very fortunate to have him. He has a very experienced background in public communications, most recently as the PIO for the city of South Pasadena. He's also worked for um, the uh, Long Beach City College and City of Long Beach Port uh, Department as well, and started his career as a journalist. So um, really a wealth of experience and has already hit the ground running. So just really glad to have him on board. All right, thank you. Welcome, John. Um, all right, Madam Clerk. Motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the City Council at either this meeting or the previous meeting may be made only by one of the Council members who voted with the prevailing side. Any motions for reconsideration? Seeing none, we stand adjourned. Thank you very much.